The Senate will come to order. The chaplain will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, you are our light and salvation, and we are not afraid. You protect us from danger, so we do not tremble. Mighty God, you are not intimidated by the challenges that confront our nation and world. Lord, inspire our lawmakers with the knowledge of your holiness that will give them reverential awe. Remind them of the many prayers they have prayed that you have already answered. Lord, you have been our help in ages past. You are our hope for the years to come. We magnify your holy name. Don't stay far off. Show yourself strong to this generation and fill us with your peace. We pray in your powerful name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk will read the communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., December 19th, 2019, to the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Tillis, a senator from the state of North Carolina, to perform the duties of the chair, signed Chuck Grassley, President Pro Tempore. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the House message to accompany H.R. 1865, which the Kirk will report. House message to accompany H.R. 1865, an act to require the Secretary of the Treasury to mint a coin and so forth and for other purposes. Mr. President. Majority Leader. Last night, House Democrats finally did what they had decided to do a long time ago. They voted to impeach uh, President Trump. Over the last 12 weeks, 
House Democrats have conducted the most rushed, least thorough, and most unfair impeachment inquiry in modern history. Now, their slapdash process has concluded in the first purely partisan presidential impeachment since the wake of the Civil War. The opposition to impeachment was bipartisan. Only one part of one faction wanted this outcome. The House's conduct risks a deeply damaging the institutions of American government. This particular House of Representatives has let its partisan rage at this particular president create a toxic new precedent that will echo well into the future. That's what I want to discuss right now. The historic degree to which House Democrats have failed to do their duty and what it will mean for the Senate to do ours. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the fact that Washington Democrats made up their minds to impeach President Trump since before he was even inaugurated. Here's a reporter in April of 2016, April of 2016. Donald Trump isn't even the Republican nominee yet, but impeachment is already on the lips of pundits, newspaper editorials, constitutional scholars, and even a few members of Congress, April 2016. On Inauguration Day, 2017, the headline in the Washington Post, the campaign to impeach President Trump has begun. That was day one. In April 2017, three months into the presidency, a senior House Democrat said, I'm going to fight every day until he's impeached. That was three months into the administration. In December 2017, two years ago, Congressman Jerry Nadler was openly campaign, campaigning to be the ranking member on the House Judiciary Committee, specifically, specifically because he was an expert on impeachment. That's the Nadler's campaign to be the top Democrat on judiciary. This week wasn't even the first time House Democrats have introduced articles of impeachment. It was actually the seventh time. They started less than six months after the president was sworn in. They tried to impeach President Trump for being impolite to the press, for being mean to professional athletes, for changing President Obama's policy on transgender people in the military. All of these things were high crimes and misdemeanors, according to Democrats. Now, this wasn't just a few people. Scores, scores of Democrats voted to move forward with impeachment on three of those prior occasions. So let's be clear. The House's vote yesterday was not some neutral judgment that Democrats came to with great reluctance. It was the predetermined end of a partisan crusade that began before President Trump was even nominated, let alone sworn in. For the very first time in modern history, we've seen a political faction in Congress promise from the moment, the moment a president election ended, they would find some way to overturn it. A few months ago, Democrats' three-year-long impeachment in search of articles found its way to the subject of Ukraine. House Democrats embarked on the most rushed, least thorough, and most unfair impeachment inquiry in modern history. 
Chairman Schiff's inquiry was poisoned by partisanship from the outset. Its procedures and parameters were unfair in unprecedented ways. Democrats tried to make Chairman Schiff into a de facto special prosecutor, notwithstanding the fact that he is a partisan member of Congress who'd already engaged in strange and biased behavior. He scrapped the precedent to cut the Republican minority out of the process. He denied President Trump the same sorts of procedural rights that houses of both parties had provided to past presidents of both parties. President Trump's counsel could not participate in Chairman Schiff's hearings, present evidence, or cross-examine witnesses. The House Judiciary Committee's crack at this was even more ahistorical. It was like the Speaker called up Chairman Nadler and ordered one impeachment. Rush delivery, please. The committee found no facts on its own, did nothing to verify the Schiff report. Their only witnesses were liberal law professors and congressional staffers. So, Mr. President, there's a reason. The impeachment inquiry that led to President Nixon's resignation required about 14 months of hearings, 14 months in addition to a special prosecutor's investigation. With President Clinton, the independent counsel's inquiry had been underway literally for years before the House Judiciary Committee actually dug in. Mountains of evidence, mountains, mountains of testimony from firsthand fact witnesses, serious legal battles to get what was necessary. This time around, House Democrats skipped all of that, spent just 12 weeks, 12 weeks. More than a year of hearings for Nixon, multiple years of investigation for Clinton, and they've impeached President Trump in 12 weeks, 12 weeks. So let's talk about what the House actually produced in those 12 weeks. House Democrats rushed and rigged inquiry yielded two articles, two of impeachment. They are fundamentally unlike any articles that any prior House of Representatives has ever passed. The first article concerns the core events which House Democrats claim <clears throat> are impeachable. The timing of aid to Ukraine but it does not even purport to allege any actual crime. Instead, they deploy the vague phrase, abuse of power, abuse of power, to impugn the president's action in a general, indeterminate way. Speaker Pelosi's house just gave in to a temptation <clears throat> that every other house in history has managed to resist. Let me say that again. Speaker Pelosi's House just gave in to a temptation that every other House in our history has managed to resist. They impeach a president whom they do not even allege has committed an actual crime known to our laws. They've impeached simply because they disagree with a presidential act and question the motive behind it. So let's look at history. Andrew Johnson impeachment involved around a clear violation of a criminal statute, albeit an unconstitutional statute. Nixon had obstruction of justice, a felony under our laws. Clinton had perjury, also a felony. Now the Constitution does not say the House can impeach only those presidents who violate a law, but history matters. History matters and precedent matters. And there were important reasons why every previous House of Representatives in American history restrained itself, restrained itself from crossing this Rubicon. The framers of our Constitution very specifically discussed 
this issue, whether the House should be able to impeach presidents just for, quote, maladministration, just for maladministration. In other words, because the House simply thought the president had bad judgment or was doing a bad job. They talked about all this when they wrote the Constitution. The written records of our founders' debates show they specifically rejected this. They realized it would create a total dysfunction to set the bar for impeachment that low, that low. James Madison himself explained that allowing impeachment on that basis would mean the president serves at the pleasure of the Congress instead of the pleasure of the American people. It would make the president a creature, a, a creature, a creature of, of Congress, not the head of a separate and equal branch. So there were powerful reasons, Mr. President, why Congress after Congress for 230 years, 230 years, required presidential impeachment to revolve around clear, recognizable crimes, even though that was not a strict limitation. Powerful reasons why for 230 years, no house, no house opened the Pandora's box of subjective political impeachments. That 230-year tradition died last night. Now, Mr. President, House Democrats have tried to say they had to impeach President Trump on this historically thin and subjective basis because the White House challenged their request for more witnesses. And that brings us to the second article of impeachment. The House titled this one, obstruction of Congress. What it really does is impeach the president for asserting presidential privilege. The concept of executive privilege is another two century old constitutional tradition. Presidents starting with George Washington have invoked it. Federal courts have repeatedly affirmed it is a legitimate constitutional power. House Democrats requested extraordinary amounts of sensitive information from President Trump's White House, exactly the kinds of things over which presidents of both parties have asserted privilege in the past. Predictably and appropriately, President Trump did not simply roll over. He defended the constitutional authority of his office. No surprise there. It's not a constitutional crisis for a House to want more information than a president wants to give up. That's not a constitutional crisis. It's a routine occurrence. The separation of powers is messy by design. Here's what should have happened. Here's what should have happened. Either the president and Congress negotiate a settlement or the third branch of government, the judiciary, addresses the dispute between the other two. The Nixon impeachment featured disagreements over presidential privilege. So they went to court. The Clinton impeachment featured disagreements over presidential privilege. So they went to the courts. This takes time. It's inconvenient. That's actually the point. Due process is not meant to maximize the convenience of the prosecutor. It's meant to protect the accused. But this time was different. Remember, 14 months of hearings for Richard Nixon, years of investigation for Bill Clinton, 12 weeks for Donald Trump. Democrats didn't have to rush this. But they chose to stick to their political timetable at the expense of pursuing more evidence through proper legal channels. Nobody made Chairman Schiff do this. He chose to. 
The Tuesday before last on live television, Adam Schiff explained to the entire country that if House Democrats had let the justice system follow its normal course, they might not have gotten to impeach the president in time for the election. My goodness. In Nixon, the courts were allowed to do their work. In Clinton, the courts were allowed to do their work. Only these House Democrats decided due process is too much work. They'd rather impeach with no proof. Well, Mr. President, they tried to cover for their own partisan impatience by pretending that the routine occurrence of a president exerting constitutional privilege is itself, itself, a second impeachable offense. The following is something that Adam Schiff literally said in early October. Here's what he said. Any action that forces us to litigate or to have to consider litigation will be considered further evidence of obstruction of justice. That's Adam Schiff. Here's what the chairman effectively said and what one of his committee members restated just this week. If the president asserts his constitutional rights, is that much more evidence he's guilty? If the president asserts his constitutional rights, is that much more evidence he's guilty? That kind of bullying is antithetical to American justice. So those are House Democrats' two articles of impeachment. That's all their rushed and rigged inquiry could generate. An act that the House does not even allege is criminal and a nonsensical claim that exercising a legitimate presidential power is somehow an impeachable offense. Mr. President, this is by far the thinnest basis for any House passed presidential impeachment in American history. The thinnest and the weakest, and nothing else even comes close. And candidly, I don't think I'm the only person around here who realizes that. Even before the House voted yesterday, Democrats had already started to signal uneasiness, uneasiness with its end product. Before the articles even passed, the Senate Democratic leader went on television to demand that this body redo House Democrats' homework for them. That the Senate should supplement Chairman Schiff's sloppy work so it is more persuasive than Chairman Schiff himself bothered to make it. Of course, every such demand simply confirms that House Democrats have rushed forward with a case that is much too weak. Back in June, Speaker Pelosi promised the House would build an ironclad case. Never mind that she was basically promising impeachment months, months before the Ukraine events, uh, but that's a separate matter. She promised an ironclad case. <clears throat> and in March, Speaker Pelosi said this, impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there is something so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country, end quote. <coughs> by the speaker's own standards, the standards she set. She has failed the country. The case is not compelling, not overwhelming, and as a result, not bipartisan. The failure was made clear to everyone earlier this week when Senator Schumer began searching for ways the Senate could step out of our proper role and try to fix the House Democrats' failures for them. And it was made even more clear last night when Speaker Pelosi suggested that House Democrats may be too afraid 
too afraid to even transmit their shoddy work product to the Senate. Mr. President, it looks like the prosecutors are getting cold feet in front of the entire country and second-guessing whether they even want to go to trial. They said impeachment was so urgent that it could not even wait for due process, but now they're content to sit on their hands. This is really comical. Democrats' own actions concede that their allegations are unproven. The articles aren't just unproven, they're also constitutionally incoherent. Incoherent. Frankly, if either of these articles is blessed by the Senate, we could easily see the impeachment of every future president of either party. Let me say that again. If the Senate blesses this historically low bar, we will invite the impeachment of every future president. The House Democrats' allegations, as presented, are incompatible with our constitutional order. They are unlike anything that has ever been seen in 230 years of this republic. House Democrats want to create new rules for this president because they feel uniquely enraged. They feel in uniquely enraged. But long after the partisan fever of this moment has broken, the institutional damage will remain. I've described the threat to the presidency. This also imperils the Senate itself. The House has created an unfair, unfinished product that looks nothing, nothing like any impeachment inquiry in American history. And if the Speaker ever gets her House in order, that mess will be dumped over here on the Senate's lap. If the Senate blesses this slapdash impeachment, if we say that from now on, this is enough, then we invite an endless parade of impeachable trials. Future houses of either party will feel free to toss up a jump ball every time they feel angry, free to swamp the Senate with trial after trial, no matter how baseless the charges. We'd be giving future houses of either party unbelievable new power to paralyze the Senate at their whim. More thin arguments, more incomplete evidence, more partisan impeachments. In fact, Mr. President, this same House of Representatives has already indicated that they themselves may not be finished impeaching. The House Judiciary Committee told a federal court this very week that it will continue its impeachment investigation even after voting on these articles. And multiple Democratic members have already called publicly for more. If the Senate blesses this, if the nation accepts this, presidential impeachments may cease being a once-in-a-generation event and become a constant part a constant part of the political background noise. This extraordinary tool of last resort may become just another part of the arms race of polarization. Real statesmen would have recognized, no matter their view of this president, that trying to remove him on this thin and partisan basis could unsettle the foundations of our republic. Real statesmen would have recognized no matter how much partisan animosity might be coursing through their veins, that cheapening the impeachment process was not the answer. Historians will regard this as a great irony of our era, that so many who profess such concern for our norms and traditions themselves proved willing to trample our constitutional order to get their way. It is long past time for Washington to get a little perspective. President Trump is not the first president with a populist streak, not the first to make entrenched elites 
uncomfortable. He's certainly not the first president to speak bluntly, to mistrust the administrative state, or to rankle unelected bureaucrats. And heaven knows he's not the first president to assert the constitutional privileges of his office rather than roll over when Congress demands unlimited, sensitive information. None of these things, none of them, is unprecedented. I'll tell you what would be unprecedented. It will be an unprecedented constitutional crisis if the Senate literally hands the House of Representatives a new partisan vote of no confidence that the founders intentionally withheld, destroying the independence of the presidency. It will be unprecedented if we agree that any future House that dislikes any future president can rush through an unfair inquiry, skip the legal system, and paralyze the Senate with a trial. The House could do that at will under this precedent. It will be unprecedented if the Senate says secondhand and thirdhand testimony from unelected civil service servants is enough to overturn the people's vote. It will be an unprecedented constitutional crisis if the Senate agrees to set the bar this low forever. It is clear what this moment requires. It requires the Senate to fulfill our founding purpose. The framers built the Senate to provide stability, to take the long view of our republic, to safeguard institutions from the momentary hysteria that sometimes consumes our politics, to keep partisan passions from literally boiling over. The Senate exists for moments like this. That's why this body has the ultimate say in impeachments. The framers knew the House would be too vulnerable to transient passions and violent factionalism. They needed a body that would consider legal questions about what has been proven and political questions about what the common good of our nation requires. Hamilton said explicitly in Federalist 65 that impeachment involves not just legal questions, but inherently political judgments about what outcome best serves the nation. The House can't do both. The courts can't do both. This is as grave an assignment as the Constitution gives to any branch of government. And the framers knew only the Senate could handle it. Well, the moment the framers feared has arrived. A political faction in the lower chamber have succumbed to partisan rage. A political faction in the House of Representatives has succumbed to a partisan rage. They have fulfilled Hamilton's philosophy that impeachment will, quote, connect itself with the pre-existing factions, enlist all their animosities, and there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of parties than by the, by the real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. Alexander Hamilton. That's what happened in the House last night. The vote did not reflect what had been proven. It only reflects how they feel about the president. The Senate must put this right. We must rise to the occasion. There's only one outcome that is suited to the paucity of evidence, the failed inquiry, the slapdash case. Only one outcome 
suited to the fact that the accusations themselves are constitutionally incoherent. Constitutionally incoherent. Only one outcome will preserve core precedents rather than smash them into bits in a fit of partisan rage because one party still cannot accept the American people's choice in 2016. It could not be clearer which outcome would serve the stabilizing, institution-preserving, fever-breaking role for which the United States Senate was created and which outcome would betray it. The Senate's duty is clear. The Senate's duty is clear. When the time comes, we must fulfill it. <clears throat> now, Mr. President, I understand there are three bills at the desk due a second reading in block. Clerk will read the titles of the bill for the second time on block. <clears throat> H.R. 397, an act to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 and so forth and for other purposes. H.R. 1759, an act to amend Title III of the Social Security Act and so forth and for other purposes. H.R. 4018, an act to provide that the amount of time that an elderly offender <coughs> must serve before being eligible for placement in home detention is to be reduced by the amount of good time credits earned by the prisoner and for other purposes. In order to place the bills on the calendar and the provisions of Rule 14, I would object to further proceedings and block. Objection having been heard, the bills will be placed on calendar on block. Or call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. The Democratic Leader. A quorum, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Now, Mr. President, last night, the House of Representatives voted to impeach President Donald Trump. It is only the third time in our nation's history that the President of the United States has been impeached. The Articles of Impeachment charge that President Trump abused the powers of his office by soliciting the interference of a foreign power in our elections, not for the good of the country, but to benefit himself personally. The articles also charge that the President obstructed Congress in the investigation of those matters. Together, these articles suggest the President committed a grave injury to our grand democracy. The conduct they describe is very much what the founders feared when they forged the impeachment powers of the Congress. The founders, in their wisdom, gave the House the power to accuse, the Senate the power to judge. We are now asked to fulfill our constitutional role as a court of impeachment. Now that the House of Representatives has impeached President Trump, the nation turns its eyes to the Senate. What will the nation see? Will the nation see what Alexander Hamilton saw? A body of government with confidence enough to preserve, unawed and uninfluenced, the necessary impartiality? Or will the nation see the Senate dragged into the depths of partisan fervor? The nation just witnessed how the Republican leader sees his role in this chapter of our history, demonstrating both an unfortunate descent into partisanship and demonstrating the fundamental weakness of the President's defense. Leader McConnell claimed that the impeachment of President Trump is illegitimate because the House voted along party lines. Forgive me, but House Democrats cannot be held responsible for the cravenness of the House Republican Caucus and their blind fealty to the President. Leader McConnell claimed the impeachment was motivated by partisan rage. This from the man who said proudly, I am not impartial, I have no intention to be impartial at all in the trial of President Trump. What hypocrisy. Leader McConnell accused the House Democrats of an obsession to get rid of President Trump. This from the man who proudly declared his number one goal was to make President Obama a one-term president. Leader McConnell claimed that Democrats impeached the president for asserting executive privilege. President Trump never formally claimed executive privilege. He claimed, quote, absolute immunity unquote. And the White House counsel wrote a letter sim stating simply that the administration would not comply with any subpoenas. <laughs> Leader McConnell claimed that the Democrats, quote, obsession with impeachment has prevented the House from pursuing legislation to help the American people. Leader McConnell knows very, very well that the House Democratic majority has passed hundreds, literally hundreds of bills that gather dust here in the Senate, condemned to a legislative graveyard by none other than Leader McConnell himself, who proudly called himself the Grim Reaper. Members of the Senate, of the, members of the 116th Senate have been de denied the opportunity to legislate by Leader McConnell. We aren't even allowed to debate the issues that would impact the American people. Health care, infrastructure, prescription drugs. We could have spent the year debating these issues. We weren't doing impeachment. Leader McConnell has chosen not to focus on these issues and to put none of these bills on the floor. And as he reminds us often, he alone decides what goes on the floor. 
Leader McConnell claimed that the House did not afford the President due process. The leader knows well that President Trump refused to participate in the process despite invitation and blocked witnesses and documents from Congress in unprecedented fashion. Leader McConnell claimed that the House ran, quote, the most rushed, least thorough, and most unfair impeachment inquiry in modern history. I know that that's the Republican talking point, but here's the reality. Leader McConnell is plotting the most rushed, least thorough, and most unfair impeachment trial in modern history. His plan to prevent House managers from calling witnesses to prove their case is a dramatic break from precedent. We heard a lot about precedent from the leader. Never has there been a presidential impeachment trial in which the majority prevented the House managers from fairly presenting their case to have witnesses explain their knowledge of the alleged malfeasance. Will Leader McConnell, breaking precedent, strong arm his caucus into making this the first Senate impeachment trial of the president in history that heard no, no witnesses? We ask, is the president's case so weak that none of the president's men can defend him under oath? Is the president's case so weak that none of the president's men can defend him under oath? If the House case is so weak, why is Leader McConnell so afraid of witnesses and documents? We believe the House case is strong, very strong. But if the Republican leader believes it's so weak, why is he so afraid of relevant witnesses and documents? which will not prolong things very long in our proposal, four hours for each witness. It is true, as the leader has said, that the framers built the Senate to provide stability and to keep partisan passions from boiling over. However, their vision of the Senate is a far cry from the partisan body Senator McConnell has created. I hope, the America, I hope America was watching the Republican leader deliver his speech. I truly do. Because most glaring of all was the fact that Leader McConnell's 30-minute partisan stem winder contained hardly a single defense of the President of the United States on the merits. Almost none defended President Trump because they can't. In the wake of an enormous amount of evidence uncovered by House investigators, much of it in the form of testimony by top Trump officials whom the administration tried to silence, the Republican leader could not rebut the accusations against the president with facts. The Republican leader, claimed about, claim, the Republican leader complained about the process. The Republican leader made many partisan and inflammatory accusations about Democrats, but he did not advance an argument in defense of the president's conduct on the merits. That, in and of itself, is a damning reflection of the state of the president's defense. Our goal in the Senate, above all, should be to conduct a fair and speedy trial I have proposed a very reasonable structure that would do just that. Four witnesses, only those with direct knowledge of the charges made by the House, only those who could provide new, relevant, and potentially illuminating testimony, strict time limits on each stage of the process to prevent the trial from dragging out too long. It's eminently reasonable. It's eminently fair a group who had no partisan bias would come up with this type of proposal. I have yet to hear one good argument why less evidence is better than more evidence, particularly in such a serious moment as impeachment of the President of the United States. In Leader McConnell's 30-minute screed, he did not make one argument why the witness and document should not be part of the trial.
President Trump protests that he did not receive due process in the House impeachment inquiry. Due process is the ability to respond to charges made against you and present your side of the case. The President was invited to provide witnesses and provide documents at every stage of the process. He chose not to. Still, Democrats are offering the President due process again here in the Senate. The witnesses we suggest are top Trump-appointed officials. They aren't Democrats. We don't know if their testimony would exculpate the President or incriminate him. But their testimony should be heard. If the President's counsel wants to call other witnesses with direct knowledge of why the aid to Ukraine was delayed, we say they should be able to do so. President Trump claims he wants due process. I suspect he would rather hide or name call, because if he really wanted due process, he could get it easily. One phone call to Leader McConnell telling him to let his aides testify. One phone call to his chief of staff telling him to release the documents to Congress. Both of these actions would let the truth come out. I ask again, can none of the President's men come defend him under oath? To my Republican colleagues, our message is a simple one. Democrats want a fair trial that examines the relevant facts. We want a fair trial. The message from Leader McConnell at the moment is that he has no intention of conducting a fair trial, no intention of acting impartially, no intention of getting the facts. Despite our disagreements, I will meet with Leader McConnell soon to discuss the rules. But each senator will influence whether the Senate lives up to its constitutional duty to serve as an impartial court of impeachment. In the coming weeks, Republican senators will face a choice. Each Republican senator will face a choice. Do they want a fair trial? Or do they want to allow the President free reign? Each senator must ask him or herself, do you want a fair trial? Or do you want the President to do whatever he wants, regardless of rule of law, regardless of the consequences to this great nation? The nation turns its eyes to the Senate. What will it see? The President of the United States has spent the past several months telling Congress it has no right to oversight, no right to investigate any of his activities, that he has absolute immunity, that Article II of the Constitution gives him, quote, the right to do whatever he wants, unquote. That's the President's words. Past Senates have disagreed with such views and strongly and proudly stood up for the notion that the President is not omnipotent. Democrats have done it. Republicans have done it. And often, presidents of their own party. The Senate has said in the past that the president serves the people, not himself, that he is not a king. Will it do so again, or will it shirk from that responsibility? If the Republicans proceed with the majority leader's scheme to sweep these charges under the rug and permit the president to ignore Congress, they will be creating a new precedent that will long be remembered as one of the Senate's darkest chapters. It will be remembered as a time when a simple majority in the Senate sought to grant two new rights to the President, the right to use the government for personal purposes and the right to ignore Congress at his pleasure. Here, I agree with Senator McConnell. Moments like this are why the Senate exists. If the President commits high crimes and misdemeanors, and the Congress can do nothing about it, not even conduct a fair tribunal where his conduct is judged, 
by dispassionate representatives of the people, then the President can commit those crimes with impunity. This President can, others can. I have little doubt that if we tell the President that he can escape scrutiny in this instance, he will do it again and again and again. Future presidents will take note and may do worse. And the most powerful check on the executive, the one designed to protect the people from tyranny, will be erased. This chapter in our history books could be a lesson about the erosion of checks and balances in our modern age, or it could be a proud reaffirmation of those founding principles. This chapter in our history books could be about the overpowering partisanship of our times, or it could be about the Senate's capacity to overcome it. Again, moments like this are why the United States Senate exists. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Utah. It's December, Mr. President. And so America's attention turns once again to the great debate of our time. What's the best Christmas movie? Is it White Christmas, maybe Elf, a Christmas Story, Home Alone, Die Hard? That's a good one. A lot of people are partial to It's a Wonderful Life or Braveheart. Now, Braveheart, of course, has nothing to do with Christmas, but it's about freedom, and nothing says freedom quite like Christmas. We have to debate, you see, the, the best Christmas movie out there for the simple reason that we also have to watch every year the worst Christmas movie. The worst Christmas movie is the one that runs every single year from this chamber right here in this city on C-SPAN, just the week before our Lord's birthday. It's called Omnibus. Critics and fans have loved to hate it for years. And as is always the case in these money-grabbing sequels, the actors and the writers and the directors are just mailing it in. They know they can do this every year, and it works for them, and so they mail it in. The only plot twist this time around is that instead of a continuing resolution or a single omnibus, leaders and appropriators have cleverly put the negotiated spending agreement into two bills so that we can all pretend that it's better than just one. Even though they were negotiated at the same time, released to the public at the same time, and will be voted on within only minutes of each other. We've had different formulations of this over the years. Sometimes it's a continuing resolution. Sometimes it's an omnibus. Sometimes it's a couple of minibuses capped off with uh, a, 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 an, another continuing resolution. Sometimes we call it a cromnibus. This time, I think we could call it a double-decker minibus. But whatever you want to call it, it's the same movie. It's a rerun, and it's not very good. In fact, it's really, really bad. The secretive, undemocratic, irresponsive, and ultimately irresponsible process that produced this bill is nothing short of a sham. But then again, so is the substance of the bill itself. It's been like this for years now. Instead of actively setting and passing budgets within which we intend to stay, as we expect from any other organization, we make it up as we go along in as abusive and dysfunctional a fashion as the American people will possibly let us get away with. Because that seems to be our aim, do whatever they let us get away with. In fact, the last time Congress passed all of its respective appropriations bills in each of the dozen or so categories in which we spend money, uh, and we passed each of those bills unbundled and on time, it was back in 1997. For this fiscal year, we've already passed two continuing resolutions. Now, an omnibus bill in and of itself doesn't have to be a bad thing. In, in fact, one could make it a relatively good thing. You see, an omnibus could, in theory, be a decent legislative vehicle. 
if, and only if, that is, members of the House and the Senate were given time to read it and to debate it and to offer and consider and vote upon amendments to offer improvements to that legislation. And so I really don't care whether it's a dozen individual spending bills or a small handful of mini buses uh, or, or whether it's a single bill. What I want is consideration on the floor of the Senate in front of the American people so that they can be aware of what's happening, so that we can be able to exercise the election certificates that we so hard, uh, that we fought for so hard. Each one of us is made more relevant when we get that opportunity and less relevant when we are denied it. Unfortunately, it's just never the case anymore that we have those kinds of opportunities to debate and discuss and consider amendments and, and to receive the underlying legislation in enough time for any of this to make a difference. These bills, Mr. President, are written entirely behind closed doors by a small handful of leaders from two parties, thousands of pages of spending, trillions of dollars, and released to public scrutiny for the first time within only hours of what would otherwise become a government shutdown. And you see, this is a feature, not a bug. For those in charge of this process, this is a good thing, because this is what allows them to write it on their own. The law firm, as I sometimes describe it, the law firm of McConnell, Schumer, Pelosi, McCarthy, and a small handful of staffers and a few other members around them write this bill, and then it's presented to us as a single binary take-it-or-leave-it package. You fund this and everything in it, or you fund nothing. You vote for this package, or you're blamed for a government shutdown. It's not right. This, we somehow managed to call, rather euphemistically, bipartisanship. And like too much of what Washington calls bipartisanship these days, these spending bills are a fiscal dumpster fire. You see, they're masquerading under the banner of bipartisan compromise, when in fact they are collusion. Collusion just by a small handful of members of Congress who don't have to have their provisions debated and discussed and subject to amendment. On the merits, and not just on the procedure, this bill is a dumpster fire. Discretionary spending will be set at record high levels in nearly every category of government spending. This omnibus, or double-decker minibus, as I sometimes call it, will add $2.1 trillion to the national debt over the next 20 years. By that time, we'll be spending more on interest on the debt than we do on national defense. This, Mr. President, is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to the American people. It ought to be especially embarrassing to those of us elected to represent our respective states in the United States Senate. What has historically called itself the world's greatest deliberative legislative body has become something substantially less glorious than that. When we had a trillion dollar deficit after the 2008 financial crisis, everyone admitted it. Everyone admitted that it was a problem, that it was reckless and out of control. President Obama admitted it. And now we're borrowing just as much, and we're doing so at the top of the business cycle. With wages up and unemployment at record lows, it's an awful corrupt cycle on repeat. Congress breaks its own spending rules, creates new ones to spend more, and then breaks the new ones and tries to hide the evidence racking up ever more national debt all the while. What's worse, we're willingly putting the brunt of the cost of all of this on future generations, on those who are not yet here and not able to vote for or against the politicians who are doing this to them. Gorging ourselves on debt to the tune of another trillion dollars a year means that we're saddling our children and our children's children with the cost of this bill. And we're setting ourselves up for disaster come the next inevitable recession. Now, John F. Kennedy famously said that to govern is to choose. But Congress's defining dysfunction is that 
It doesn't choose. It chooses not to choose, rather deliberately. We don't budget, we don't reform, we don't prioritize. We just spend. And we hope that we're retired or, let's face it, dead when the bill for our negligence and recklessness finally comes due. Not only does this package feature reckless spending, but it includes many bills that it should not. With Congress funding broken, inefficient, and in many cases downright harmful programs. For instance, this bill reauthorizes the National Flood Insurance Program, a program that might sound nice, but it subsidizes beachfront properties right in the middle of dangerous floodplains, and which is already in more than $20 billion of debt to American taxpayers for a full year without a single reform. This, by the way, after every single time it's been reauthorized, for years running, we have discussed, I and others have been promised, that the next time around we'll have an opportunity to offer amendments. We'll have an opportunity to reform the flood insurance program. It can be reformed, and it must be reformed. We've been promised reforms for years, but this bill just reauthorizes it for a full year without a single reform, not one. This bill also maintains the broken status quo for overseas contingency operations. For those Americans who aren't familiar with this term, or OCO as it's sometimes described, this is the Pentagon's increasingly unaccountable and widely abused slush fund, insulated from scrutiny by unchecked budget caps. The deal appropriates another $71.5 billion for OCO, a $4 billion increase just from last year alone. This, Mr. President, only days after America learned that civilian and military leaders have been lying to the American people for years across multiple presidential administrations about our failures in Afghanistan. Instead of reform or oversight, these bills would put another $4.1 billion into the Afghanistan Security Forces Fund and limit our ability to negotiate peace and bring the war in Afghanistan finally to an end. In an era of rampant fake news, even the media is outperforming Congress on this issue. These bills include $495 million for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, a 13% increase from the last fiscal year and the highest appropriation it has had in 17 years, all for a program that has been of particular detriment to my state of Utah. The LWCF has been used as a tool for the federal government to gradually acquire more and more land, even as it's failing to care for the lands that it already owns with a current maintenance backlog of $19.4 billion. Worse, in addition to funding broken programs, it funds blatant, abusive cronyism. The bill reauthorizes the Export-Import Bank, Washington's favorite among favor banks, which doles out taxpayer-backed loans to help American exporters. And it does so for a full seven years without even so much of a word of debate. This notwithstanding the fact that the Export-Import Bank has been the subject of very intense debate in this body for many years and with good reason. Why? Well, among other things, the biggest recipient of Export-Import Bank funds is Pemex, Mexico's infamous corrupt state-owned oil company. So corrupt, in fact, that its own employees collaborate with Mexico's drug cartels to facilitate the theft of their best oil and of their refined petroleum products. That theft has, in fact, become so rampant that in Mexico there's a term coined to refer to that kind of theft. Those who engage in it are called huachicoleros. Huachicoleros. We are funding, and we are insulating from the ramifications of that theft. Pemex, a corrupt institution that doesn't operate well, in part because it's the victim of theft, and in part because it's being backed up by the United States government. And ranked right after Pemex is the People's Republic of China, whose state-owned enterprises are granted generous American taxpayer-backed financing for purchases they could fund through their own communist government. 
Now, say what you want about China, about U.S.-China relations on trade, about military issues related to China, whatever national security issues we might be concerned about with China. But I don't know many people. In fact, I don't know anyone outside of this town, Mr. President, who thinks that the United States government should be propping up China, should we be giving money through the Export-Import Bank or otherwise to China. That's not our job. That's not the role of the U.S. taxpayer who works hard every day to earn money, which then might be sent to a communist government in China. The reauthorization even includes provisions instructing the Export-Import Bank to pretend that it's helping Americans to compete against China at the same time that it's sending that very government billions of dollars. And then there's the extension of the brand USA Act, a seven-year reauthorization of a government-chartered nonprofit brand USA to use tens of millions of federal dollars to advertise for tourism. To top things off, a last-minute tax extenders deal was added to the package late on Monday night, diverting billions of dollars on sec central economic planning and picking winners and losers in the marketplace. Over the next 10 years, this package provides about $2.7 billion in tax benefits through programs that use the tax code to incentivize businesses to invest in government-selected neighborhoods, seeking to control the flow of investment instead of relying on the free market to make those decisions. And it includes naked handouts to cronyist special interests. For example, it spends over $2.1 billion for subsidies on the energy sector. Not energy generally, but to specific winners within the energy industry that this small handful of purported leaders in Congress has decided will benefit from the hardworking taxpayer dollars that will be doled out. The bill, among other things, engages in awarding $113 million for coal production on Indian lands, $331 million for facilities to refuel alternative fuel vehicles, and $1.5 billion for biodiesel and renewable diesel tax credits, for instance, as if the federal government weren't already mired sufficiently in this area, this bill devotes even more. Beyond these, it hands out $187 million in write-offs for owners of motorsport entertainment complexes, $18 million in tax breaks for the production of movies and TV shows, and $3 million in tax credits for the purchasers of two-wheeled plug-in electric vehicles, just to name a few examples. And not only that, but it features new levels of absurdity, too. This deal actually includes a special interest bailout to make up for the failures of a faulty pension plan, while at the same time authorizing another pension plan to follow in its same footsteps. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to speak for an additional three minutes. Is there objection? Congress authorized a group of coal miners' multi-employer pension plans under problematic rules, allowing them to underfund the plans by over 70 percent. But all the while, those pensions still promised their workers full benefit, setting up unreasonable expectations for their return on investment. Inevitably, they have not made up the shortfall, and now the taxpayers are being asked to bail them out. And in the very same bill, in which we're bailing out the coal miners' pensions. We're authorizing a select group of community newspapers, not all newspapers, not all media enterprises, just a select group of hand-picked community newspapers to follow the same practice, allowing them once again to underfund their workers' pensions, while again promising them a full return on benefits. With this bill, we're rubber stamping the expectation that employers are free to raid from their workers' promised retirement benefits for their own short-term gain and setting the precedent that the government will reward this bad practice by bailing them out when that inevitably becomes a problem. This bill, however, does include some good measures that I support, like repealing the medical device tax, fixing a tax provision that would unfairly subject churches to more taxes, and making retirement account reforms that allow Americans to access these funds in times of a particular need. And sadly, 
I, like many of our colleagues, will be forced to vote against these measures because they've been lumped into this massive, stinking package where the only choice we have is a binary one. We have no option to vote for the things that we like. This is wrong. There is no finite cap on our ability to debate these things other than the artificial ones that we have created rather deliberately within this body, and that's wrong. The thing about these omnibuses is they put us in a take it or leave it position. We're given no choice but to support or oppose the whole thing, good and bad measures alike. Unfortunately, just like every other episode in this squalid saga, I'll call this one Omnibus 2, the bussening. This one, too, will come to a predictable, sad, sorry ending. Congress will pass the mess, indulging in a process, substance, and long-term result that are all an affront to the viewers. Because at the end of the day, the audience members are real-life victims. We can do better. We can, we must, and we will. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. <coughs> Mr. President. <coughs> the Senator from Vermont. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. President, before I begin, I would ask unanimous consent that Virginia Flores, a detailee of the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Subcommittee, be granted floor privileges for the debate and action on H.R. 1158 and H.R. 1865. Without objection. <coughs> Mr. President, I am pleased to be here with my, <coughs> excuse me, start over again. I'm pleased to be here with my good friend, the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Shelby of Alabama. Uh, we worked hard on this bill. He is Chairman, myself as Vice Chairman. We reached a bipartisan, bicameral agreement that will fund the federal government in fiscal year 2020. The agreement rejects some devastating and short-sighted cuts proposed by the President. It makes historic investments in the American people and working families. It fully implements the bipartisan budget agreement, allows us to invest an additional $27 billion in non-defense programs to benefit our nation's children, improve our educational institutions, protect our environment, combat the opioid crisis, promote and grow our economy, invest in our infrastructure, and protect our elections. There's a lot in here. <clears throat> the, 12 <coughs> excuse me, the 12 appropriations bills are put into two minibuses. The first we refer to as the domestic minibus bill. That is a strong bipartisan bill that makes real and historic investments in the American people and our communities. It rejects the proposals, the anti-science, know-nothingism proposals by making record-level investments in science and research programs. We all know that you have to invest in science and research, and you can't turn this on and off year by year. We have to do it long range. But we also have to invest in our children in education. We have increases in programs with proven success, Head Start, Child Care Development Block Grants, Child Nutrition Programs, 21st Century Learning Grants, Pell Grants, and others. For the third year in a row, it continues the historic level of funding to combat opioids that we began in fiscal year 2018. Funding that is critical for our state and local governments because they're at the front lines of this battle. The agreement provides over $5 billion more than the President's budget to protect national parks and public lands and fund critical environmental protection and conservation programs. These national parks are an important part of our heritage. The presiding officer has some of the most beautiful ones in the country and his state. But we all have a different kind. And I think of how the brilliance of people like President Theodore Roosevelt in saying, let's preserve. And even though the administration denies that climate change exists, 
The agreement includes significant resources to combat this threat in the new fiscal year. It rejects the President's proposal to totally eliminate key federal affordable housing and economic development programs. And for the first time in decades, <clears throat> Congress has come together to fund $25 million for gun violence research by the Centers for Disease Control and the NIH. That is a significant step to combat the gun violence epidemic and rashes school shootings that are facing our great nation. It's a good bill. It's certainly going to improve the lives of Vermonters, but improve the lives of millions of Americans in all the other states. It will provide <clears throat> support for working families, support and promote our economy. In a few moments, we're going to vote on the motion to invoke cloture on this bill, and I will urge an I vote. And the second package of bills we, we refer to as the National Security Minibus Bill. Critical funding to support our troops, invest in our military, protect our nation from threats ongoing, both foreign and domestic. We have $425 million for election security grants. While the administration has not requested anything I heard from secretaries of state, Republicans and Democrats alike throughout the country, uh, including our own Jim Condos, of the need for these election security grants. It's a matter of national security because we preserve our democracy and we have to maintain full faith in our elections. We also fund the constitutionally mandated 2020 decennial census. That's in the U.S. Constitution. Not only determines congressional apportionment, but also is relied on to distribute $900 billion in federal funds. We have to have a fair and accurate account. The money provided bill will help us achieve that. But we also have significant investments to fight crime and terrorism, implement criminal justice reforms, combat violence against women, keep communities safe. We also have funding for the Department of Homeland Security. I'm looking at the time, uh, Mr. President, and I would ask, um, you know, I, I would note that we have one area. It's been a lightning rod in both chambers. We tried to, DHS, to get a bill to receive the required number of votes to pass. And the reason it's been difficult is the President's insistence that we waste taxpayer money on an ineffective and foolish wall on the southern border. We all want secure borders, a wall that can be easily cut by a $100 power size you can buy at a local hardware store is not security. And we worry about the cruel, ineffective immigration policies. Last year, our the President put us into a 35-day government shutdown uh, when Congress refused to fund the anti-immigration law. Uh, that uh, cost the taxpayers of this country billions of dollars that could have been spent on better things. But we reached a resolution. Again, I compliment Senator Shelby and Congresswomen Lowy and Granger because we met hours in my office and worked our way through that. But under this bill, we had negotiations. The President will receive $1.375 billion for barriers on the southern border, which is what he would have received if we had a continuing resolution. I would have preferred no funding, but we are at least making clear uh, that you cannot go and take this money out of other things that we need for the uh, protection of our soldiers, our uh, ranchers, our farmers, and so on. I wish we could have done even more. Uh, but uh, there are some important changes. I am happy with them. I do thank Chairman Shelby for his hard work in negotiating these bills. The hours were long. We didn't always agree. We had a lot of weekends and evenings that we worked quietly out of sight of the press and everything else, but knowing that we could take each other's word. 
we worked in good faith to reach resolution on difficult matters. He made compromise necessary to get us a deal, as did I. And I thank my friend Senator Shelby for his leadership on the Appropriations Committee, but especially, I say this as dean of the Senate, somebody who's served with almost 20% of all the senators in this country, I thank him for his friendship. And I thank the Appropriations Committee staff on both sides of the aisle. I might go home at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. They were still there at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. They're hard work. They're sleepless nights. We could not have done this without them. I, obviously, I thank my full committee staff, Charles Kiefer, Shannon Paterni, Jessica Berry, Jay Tilton, Hannah Chauvin for their work, as well as Shannon Hines, Jonathan Graffio and David Atkins on Senator Shelby's staff, all the subcommittee. It's a long list, and I would ask consent, the whole list, be included in the record. Without objection. Because of, I've often said, uh, Mr. President, we senators are merely constitutional impediments to the staff who do all such great work, and I applaud them all on both sides of the aisle. And I yield to my distinguished chairman. Mr. President. Alabama. Mr. President, I ask uh, unanimous consent that I be allowed to finish my remarks prior to the vote. Without objection. Mr. President, just a few weeks ago, right here, Congress passed a continuing resolution to fund the government through December the 20th. At that time, few, if any of us, predicted that we would pass all 12 appropriations bills in such a small window of time. Yet today, we're poised to do just that in a few minutes. Mr. President, bipartisan cooperation has made this possible. Chairwoman Loy in the House, Ranking Member Granger on the House side, my friend Vice Chairman Leahy and myself on the Senate side, working together, change things. I believe that the four of us have shown once again, Mr. President, that if given the opportunity, we will find a bipartisan path forward to get the job done. It's very important that we do this. But I would be remiss right now if I did not recognize all members of the Appropriations Committee, Democrats and Republicans, committees on both sides of the aisle and the Capitol, our subcommittee chairs, our ranking members in particular, and of course, our staff. We would not be here, Mr. President, without their diligence and willingness to work night and day with very little sleep. I want to thank the leaders on both sides, Senator McConnell, Senator Schumer, and I especially want to take a minute, a moment here to acknowledge the role played by the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary Mnuchin, in these negotiations on behalf of the administration. Everybody together negotiated the budget agreement that paved the way for these bills, and they helped guide them down the stretch. Mr. President, Secretary Mnuchin in particular has been a voice of reason and driving force in our ability to get to yes, and we should be grateful for that. Mr. President, I believe these bills are good bills and that my colleagues can be proud to support. I do not have time here today to go into all the particulars of such a complex piece of legislation, but I want to hit a few high points as I see them. First, always first, Mr. President, to me, America's military, our national security, the security of our nation. Defense spending here has increased by $22 billion over the previous year. Our men and women in uniform receive, will receive the largest pay increase in 10 years at 3.1%, which they deserve. And Mr. President, our veterans can rest assured that they will get the health care they earned and deserve through the funding of the VA Mission Act. These are victories, Mr. President, for America, for the American people. Turning to Homeland Security, very important as well, Mr. President. 1.3.7 billion is provided for the border wall system. And the president will have some uh, greater flexibility on where he can build, what he, where he can build along the southern border. 
Not only that, but the president retains critical transfer authorities that will allow him to devote additional resources to border security and immigration enforcement. Again, the objective here, I believe, the outcome, is to make America strong. The last thing that I'll mention before wrapping up these bills, maintain, we maintain all legacy policy writers to protect life in the Second Amendment. These provisions have long been foundation, foundational strength of, for America, and I'm proud to assure my colleagues that we can carry them forward. All in all, Mr. President, these bills accommodate countless members' priorities on both sides of the aisle. I want to thank all my colleagues again for the input that they provided at the outset of this process. I also want to take a moment to, to thank my chief of staff, chief of staff of the uh, staff director of the Appropriations Committee, Shannon Hines, and her staff for all the work they've done, as well as Senator Leahy's staff working together. And now as we approach the finish line, Mr. President, I ask for their support. As the clock winds down, let's come together and do what seemed so unlikely just a month ago. Fund the entire federal government before the Christmas break. Mr. President, before I yield the floor, I want to quickly thank again all of the staff for their hard work and dedication to making this happen today. Without them, it wouldn't happen, and we know this. They've worked tirelessly on our behalf and on behalf of the American people, and we should all be grateful for their efforts. With that, I yield the floor, Mr. President. You have it. Okay. Vote automatic. Vote. Vote. Number one. The clerk will report the motion to invoke closure. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, do hereby move to bring to a closed debate on the motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1865, an act to require the Secretary of the Treasury to mint a coin in commemoration of the opening of the National Law Enforcement Museum in the District of Columbia and for other purposes signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate, the debate on the motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1865, an act to require the Secretary of the Treasury to mint a coin in commemoration of the opening of the National Law Enforcement Museum in the District of Columbia, and for other purposes shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, 
Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Rono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Markley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Perdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Resch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow.
Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thun. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Brown, Cantwell, Cardin, Casey, Collins, Coons, Kramer, Crapo, Duckworth, Gardner, Grassley, Hyde Smith, Kennedy, King, Leahy, McConnell, Peters, Roberts, Romney, Rounds, Schatz, Schumer, Stabenow. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Blackburn, Braun, Danes, Enzi, Hawley, Scott of Florida. Ms. Cinema, Ms. Cinema, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst, no. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed, aye. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, no. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray. Aye. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester. Aye. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Heinrich. Aye. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Ms. Hirono. Ms. Hirono. Aye. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. No.
Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, aye. Mrs. Capito, Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, Ms. Cortez Masto, aye. Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, aye. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Ms. Rosen, Ms. Rosen, aye. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, no. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, aye. Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, aye.
Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, no. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, no. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, no. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Purdue, Mr. Purdue, aye. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, no. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, no. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, aye.
Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenthal, aye. Mr. Alexander, Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, aye. Ms. Hassan, Ms. Hassan, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, no. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, no. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, 
I. What's that? Mr. Rish, Mr. Rish. No.
On this vote, the yeas are 71, the nays are 21. Three-fifths of the senators duly chosen sworn have voted in the affirmative. The motion is agreed to. The motion to refer falls. Mr. President, Mr. President. Oh, the, the senator from uh, Vermont. President, I think we're waiting for somebody on the other side now. You, but I just want to thank everybody for joining Senator Shelby and I on, on this vote. Uh, it's going to help us move forward. But I note, as I said in my earlier remarks, Republicans and Democrats came together and worked extraordinarily hard on these appropriations bills. And it shows what can be done when, when we do that. I think the vote here is an uh, indication of that. If nobody's seeking recognition, I will uh, suggest the absence of the quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from South Dakota. Mr. President, uh, I understand the Senate is in a quorum call. It is. I would ask unanimous consent that it be lifted. Without objection. Mr. President, today the Senate is taking the final step to send much needed legislation to protect consumers from robocalls to the President's desk. I think we had hoped that this would be able to be packaged with a couple of other bills coming out of the Commerce Committee. I think uh, the, the chairman of that committee, Senator Wicker, will address those later. A data mapping bill, a secure communications uh, bill that deals with uh, ensuring that we protect our uh, technology from harmful elements, Huawei and, and uh, those sorts of things. And I would hope that we can get those cleared at some point too. But today we do want to proceed with the robocall bill. And I will just start by saying that illegal robocalls have flooded Americans' phones to the point where many folks don't want to answer their phones at all. In fact, a recent report found that only 47 percent of calls Americans receive are actually answered. This means consumers aren't answering legitimate calls that could be alerting you of fraud on your credit card, notifying you that your flight has been canceled, or reminding you of an incoming medical appointment, all calls that are important to consumers. It is clear that no one is immune to these annoying and potentially dangerous calls. Scammers use these calls to successfully prey on vulnerable populations, especially elderly Americans, and they target the kind of personal information that can be used to steal your money or your identity. And when scammers are successful, the consequences for their victims can be devastating. While there are laws and fines in place right now to prevent scam artists from preying on Americans through the telephone, these measures have been insufficient. When I serve as chairman of the Commerce Committee, Senator will be in order. Thank you, Mr. President. When I served as chairman of the Commerce Committee, I subpoenaed the mass robocaller Adrian Abramovich to testify about his operation. His testimony made it clear that robocall scammers simply build the current fines into the cost of doing business. On top of this, the Federal Communication Commission's enforcement efforts are hampered by a tight time window for pursuing violators. That's why earlier this year I introduced the legislation before us today, the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act, or the TRACE Act, with my fellow Commerce Committee member, Senator Markey. The TRACE Act provides tools to discourage illegal robocalls, protect consumers, and crack down on offenders. It expands the window in which the FCC can pursue intentional scammers and levy fines from one year to four years. The legislation also requires telephone service providers to adopt call verification technologies that would help prevent illegal robocalls from reaching consumers in the first place. The TRACE Act also recognizes the importance of legitimate calls and ensures important calls like emergency public safety calls are not wrongly blocked. And importantly, it convenes a working group with representatives from the Department of Justice, the FCC, the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Commerce, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, state attorneys general, and others to identify ways to criminally prosecute illegal robocalling. TRACE also addresses the issue of so-called one-ring scams, where international scammers try to get individuals to return their calls so that they can charge them exorbitant fees. And it directs the Federal Communications Commission to convene a working group to address the problem of illegal robocalls being made to hospitals. Mr. President, I'm very pleased that the TRACE Act received bipartisan support in both houses of Congress. And I'm especially grateful to Senator Markey for partnering with me on this legislation. And I appreciate Chairman Wicker and Ranking Member Cantwell for quickly advancing this legislation through the Com Commerce Committee this year. I also appreciate the work of our House colleagues, Representatives Pallone, Walden, Doyle, and Latta, for their work on advancing the Trace Act through the House. I'm also very pleased that this bill has attracted tremendous support from state governments and industry and consumer groups. While the Trace Act won't prevent all illegal robocalling, it's a big step, Mr. President, in the right direction. As the Washington Post editorial board recently stated, the Trace Act, and I quote, is what good, old-fashioned legislating looks like, end quote. And I couldn't agree more. No process is perfect, but today I'm excited that the Senate will be sending the Trace Act to the President's desk. And before I close, Mr. President, I'd like to quickly thank several staff members whose efforts helped get us here today. In my office, I appreciate the work of Alex Sokchin, Lauren Greenwood, Jessica McBride, and Nick Rossi. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Dan Ball, Olivia Trusty, John Keast, and Crystal Tolley on Chairman Wicker's team who worked tirelessly to help develop and advance this legislation. And as I mentioned before, 
I appreciate the great work of Senator Markey, his partnership on this bill, and I want to, I want to thank the work of Daniel Green, Joey Wender, and Bennett Butler on his staff. This truly was, Mr. President, a team effort. So I thank you. I look forward to the President's signature on the TRACE Act in the near future and hope that uh, as this bill gets implemented, that it will once again be safe to answer your phone in this country. Mr. President. Senator from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is a big day for our consumers in the United States. And I want to begin first by thanking my friend, Senator Thune, for his tremendous partnership on this legislation and the issue that we are discussing today, robocalls. Um, and that's because there are no blue robocalls. There are no red robocalls. There are only despised robocalls. Uh, that is what is bringing this chamber together today. Uh, and so I thank Senator Thune for his great leadership. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Wicker and uh, Senator Cantwell uh, for helping us to uh, navigate this uh, political pathway. Uh, today is a big day. Uh, the daily deluge of robocalls that Americans experience uh, is more than a nuisance in 2019. It is a consumer protection crisis. And so today, the United States Senate is sending Americans a holiday gift on everyone's list, stopping the plague of robocalls. Americans across the country face an epidemic of illegal and fraudulent robocalls bombarding their phones. And while their telephones were once a reliable means of communications, they have been turned against us. They are now mechanisms for scammers and fraudsters who wish to cheat and to defraud. The numbers are staggering. The, in 2019, consumers have received an estimated 54 billion robocalls. And that's 6 billion more than 2018. And we still have two more weeks to go. The year isn't even over. In November alone, an estimated 5 billion robocalls were made to Americans. That's 167 million robocalls per day. That's 7 million robocalls an hour. That's 2,000 every second in our country. In the time it takes me to make these remarks, 10,000 robocalls will have been placed across this country. In 2019, already almost 600 million robocalls have been placed to my constituents in Massachusetts. Enough is enough. The reality is that we no longer have confidence in our phones. Our phones have become tools for fraud, for scams, for harassment mechanisms by which those with bad intent can access our homes, our purses, or even our pockets at any time. Caller ID is not trusted. Important calls go unanswered. Innocent Americans are defrauded. Our seniors, in particular, are targeted. Years ago, scammers needed expensive, sophisticated equipment to robocall and robotext consumers en masse. Today, they just need a smartphone to target thousands of phones an hour at relatively little expense. And readily available software permits them to spoof their numbers, which means their true caller ID is, in fact, concealed from the person picking up the phone. These new technologies allow illegal robocallers to conduct fraud anonymously, both depriving federal regulators and consumers the ability to identify and to punish the culprit. Today, the United States Senate is putting robocall relief in sight. And I've been proud, again, to partner with Senator Thune on the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act, or TRACE Act for short. We introduced it earlier this year, and today is a culmination of that work uh, in partnership with the House of Representatives. Stopping robocalls requires a simple formula, which we have included in the TRACE Act. One, authentication. Two, blocking three enforcement. First, this bill requires carriers to adopt 
call authentication technologies so they can verify that incoming calls are legitimate before they reach consumers' phones. This will be mandatory for phone carriers. Second, the Federal Communications Commission will require phone companies to block unverified calls at no charge to consumers. And third, we will increase from one year to four years the time for the Federal Communications Commission to pursue penalties for robocallers that intentionally violate the rules. This is a recipe for success, and that is what our TRACED Act does. And at the same time, this bill also ensures that emergency public safety calls still go through. The bill we will vote on today has enormous support across the country, 54 state and territory attorneys general, all commissioners at the Federal Communications Commission and the Federal Trade Commission, major industry associations and leading consumer groups endorse the legislation and agree that the TRACED Act is an essential weapon in combating the rise of illegal, fraudulent robocalls. This robocall legislation is a political Haley's Comet. It's something we can all gather around and learn from. The robocalls we receive every day are neither Democrat nor Republican, they are a universal menace. They impact the elderly, the young, the small business owner, and the student. Our grandparents and neighbors, our teachers and our co-workers today, no one is spared from this consumer protection pandemic. Senator Thune, in my efforts, would not have been possible without the great work of groups like the National Consumer Law Center, AARP, Consumer Reports, Consumer Federation of America, Consumer Action, the National Association of Attorneys General, U.S. Telecom, uh, CTIA, NTCA, and so many more groups. These groups join the chorus of countless Americans who have raised their voices and called on Congress to pass this bipartisan, common sense legislation, and we thank you. And so, uh, what I would like to do uh, as well as um, Senator Thune is to thank my staff, Joey Wender, who is sitting out here on the floor with me right now, and Bennett Butler right over my shoulder, and Daniel Green, who worked on it, from, for Alex uh, Sackgen, uh, Daniel Ball, uh, Olivia uh, Trusty, Nick Rossi, Crystal Tully uh, from the majority staff, all partnered to make today possible. So. Uh, so, uh, and I just want to say that again, we can't thank uh, Alex uh, uh, Satchen enough uh, for uh, all the work that was done. So, uh, so I thank uh, you, Senator Thune, and I thank the uh, entire Senate for their support for this legislation, and I yield back. I appreciate that. Thank you, the Senator from Massachusetts. Uh, he and his staff were tremendous uh, in working on this, and as I said before, it's nice when we have an opportunity uh, to work in a bipartisan way on something that is uh, this meaningful in people's lives. This has a, a tremendous impact on the, the daily lives of Americans who are bombarded in many cases not just with annoying and nuisance calls but also with calls that are very uh, predatory and um, in particularly when it comes to some of our vulnerable populations. Uh, Mr. President, I have a unanimous consent request I need to get in here. I would ask consent that this be separate from the discussion that we're now having but I would ask unanimous consent that at 12.10 today, the post-closure time on the motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1865 expire, that the other pending motions and amendments be withdrawn, and Senator Enzi or his designee be recognized to raise a budget point of order followed by Senator Shelby or his designee to make a motion to waive the budget point of order. Finally, if the motion to waive is agreed to, the Senate vote on the motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1865 with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Um, Mr. President, uh, I recognize the Senator for reserving the right to object, does that mean that I won't get to give the comments before we vote? There has to be some comments about the point of order. And yeah. looking at the clock yeah. and the number of people waiting, it looks like I'm being cut out of that time. Would that be a correct interpretation? I would say, I guess my, my view would be that the gentleman from uh, uh, Wyoming wants to explain his uh, point of order. I suspect that we, we would, I don't think there'd be any objection to, to allowing him to do that. So, Then I have no objection. Okay. Thank you. Let is, me, uh, is there objection? Without objection. Mr. President, um, 
Notwithstanding Rule 22, I ask the Chair to lay before the Senate the message to accompany S-151. The Chair lays before the Senate the following message from the House of Representatives. Resolved that the bill from the Senate, S-151, entitled an act to deter criminal robocall violations and so forth and for other purposes, do pass with an amendment. Mr. President, I move to concur in the House amendment, and I know of no further debate on the motion. Is there further debate on the motion to concur? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion is agreed to. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. I recognize the Senator from Mississippi. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the time is fleeting. Uh, uh, the, the distinguished Republican whip is correct. We had hoped that the robocall bill could be included uh, uh, in unanimous consent with two other very important pieces of legislation, one being the Broadband Data Act, uh, S. 1822, which is designed to tell the FCC, go back, get the maps right, show us where we have coverage and where we do not have coverage. And uh, we, we are making great progress with that. I do believe we'll get that bill passed in just a moment. The other issue being, uh, being the, uh, the, the Huawei uh, Data uh, Security Act, uh, and I, I understand we're going to have some trouble with that. Let me, let me talk briefly before I, I make my unanimous consent request. Uh, China is up to no good with their uh, government-controlled uh, companies, Huawei and ZTE. They're required by Chinese law to do the bidding of the Chinese communist dictatorship, and that means using their equipment to spy on Americans. These, this is an undisputed fact. And it is recognized not only by Americans, but also by uh, other countries, our allies, who are taking steps to protect themselves. Japan, Australia, New Zealand, they've already begun the process of removing this dangerous ZTE and Huawei equipment from their networks. Uh, our, we have legislation that we thought was going to be um, included in this three-bill package, uh, H.R. 4998 to authorize this in the United States. Uh, uh, earlier this year, the President signed an executive order declaring a national emergency. And I agree with the President, a national emergency because of the dangerous effects of keeping Chinese equipment in our nation's critical infrastructure. Given these threats, Congress should be providing, and we have an opportunity today to remove this Huawei and ZTE equipment from American telecommunication network so that we can protect Americans. We're going to have some trouble with that on a unanimous consent. I think with the broadband data, we will not. And so at this point, Madam President, um, I'm, I'm first dealing with the Broadband Data Act. Notwithstanding Rule 22, I ask unanimous consent, consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 328 S. 1822. The clerk will report. Calendar number 328, S. 1822, a bill to require the Federal Communications Commission to issue rules relating to the collection of data and so forth and for other purposes. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. Uh, and then, Madam President, I, I ask unanimous consent that the committee amendment be withdrawn, the Wicker substitute amendment at the desk be agreed to, the bill as amended be considered, read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Without objection. Thank you, um, Madam uh, President. And, and now with regard uh, to the so-called rip and replace act uh, that, that would uh, facilitate the United States joining our allies and protecting us. 
Uh, notwithstanding Rule 22, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 4998, which was received from the House. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Madam President. The Senator from Utah. Madam President, reserving the right to object, uh, this is clearly an effort to push through last minute changes on a single bill. These changes are, in my view, reckless, unnecessary, unwise, and in any event, they were made without debate by members of this body, and specifically contrary to the manner in which this very same legislation was reported out of the Senate Commerce Committee. Now, I'm glad to see the passage of a couple of pieces of legislation just now, including the Trace Act, uh, which, which will help us fight damaging robocalls. This is good legislation. I'm also supportive of S-1822, the Broadband Data Act, which will require much-needed updates to our broadband maps. These are good pieces of legislation. I'm glad they're passed. I'm also very supportive of the legislation that is the subject of the immediate unanimous consent request, uh, that is, the Commerce Committee's reported version of S-1625, the United States 5G Leadership Act. It's an important bill. It would help us identify Huawei equipment posing an espionage risk in the United States. It would ban the use of universal service fund dollars to purchase the equipment and help reimburse small companies for the costs associated with ripping and replacing vulnerable equipment. It's an important bill, and it received careful consideration during the Senate Commerce Committee's markup on July 24, 2019. The version of this bill that passed the committee was supported unanimously by Democrats and Republicans on both sides of the aisle. That version required $700 million to be set aside in a fund to help reimburse companies for Huawei equipment replacements. The bill specified that the source of this funding was to come from the proceeds of spectrum auctions. This was a smart and good and carefully tailored pay-for that did not add to our out-of-control federal spending. So the bill, as currently written, contains a reference to a reimbursement fund and assumes that there will be reimbursements. But the bill does not specify how much funding is allocated, nor does it specify the source of these funds. I can only assume that this means the House and Senate Appropriations Committees will default to authorizing new funds rather than using the smart pay-for that the Senate Commerce Committee unanimously and wisely agreed to in July. For these reasons, I object. Objection is heard. Um. The senator from Utah. Notwithstanding Rule 2020, notwithstanding Rule 22, I ask unanimous consent that the Commerce Committee be discharged from further consideration of S. 1625 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. I ask unanimous consent that the amendments ordered, reported by the Commerce Committee be agreed to, the bill as amended be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Reserving the right to object. The Senator from Mississippi. Uh, uh, Madam President, uh, the, the Senator, my good friend from Utah, has uh, asked unanimous consent that, that we pass the version of the bill that I authored, and uh, ordinarily I would very much appreciate that. The problem uh, with his request is it prevents us from acting in this Congress, acting today to get to this ZTE and Huawei problem. We have a solution and we need to get started on it. Uh, let me also make the point. Uh, some things are worth paying for. And protecting Americans, protecting our electronic system, uh, our, our broadband communications from the Chinese-owned Huawei and ZTE is worth paying for. What my uh, unanimous consent request uh, would have done, had the senator not objected, is pass the bill, leave the issue of how we fund it to another day. Perhaps the appropriators would have decided to appropriate money for it. Had they done so, they would have um, uh, they, they would have 
operated within the budget caps, as the Appropriations Committee has done, and found room, found some offsets, and paid for it that way. Uh, the proposal that I had made that was objected to by my friend from Utah would also have left open the possibility of having it paid for by the sale of some spectrum. Uh, so I regret that uh, the gentleman is objecting uh, based on how we will pay for this very needed expenditure down the road. And so I'm, I'm compelled, Madam President, to object to my good friend's uh, unanimous consent request. Objection Madam President. Heard. Madam Senator President. from Utah. Madam President, where I come in from in Utah, $700 million is a lot of money. $700 million is something that we ought to worry about where we're going to get it. It's not unreasonable for us to request that the House of Representatives agree to the language we passed out on a bipartisan basis unanimously out of the Senate Commerce Committee. It's unfortunate in my mind that we're allowing the House of Representatives unreasonable, unwarranted demand, a demand that the chairman of the Commerce Committee himself acknowledges is one that they shouldn't object to. Uh, to rule the day and to prevent this legislation from becoming law. Thank you. Madam President. The Senator from Wisconsin. I rise today with, oh, I ask unanimous consent to speak for up to six minutes. Is there objection? Without objection. Madam President, I rise today with great pride to recognize and honor my Chief of Staff and dear friend, Bill Murat who will retire at the end of this year after 21 years of working in Congress. You know, it's a rare thing in Washington to work side by side with the same person for more than 20 years. So on the eve of your retirement, Bill, I want to share a few words about how much you have meant to me and the countless others that you have encountered during your long and storied career. Now, Bill Murat is a proud son of Stevens Point, Wisconsin. He graduated from high school and college there, earned his JD from UW Law School, and his MBA from Columbia University. Civically engaged since his youth, he served as district attorney for Portage County, Wisconsin, prior to his election to the Wisconsin State Assembly in 1994. It was there that Bill and I uh, grew a friendship as colleagues in the Wisconsin State Assembly in the 1990s. I found him to be earnest, hardworking, and a brilliant strategist and lovely storyteller. He also knew when to add good humor or a note of levity. I remember fondly one night during a midnight session of the Assembly when Bill and I and a few of our Republican colleagues were on the floor waiting for a vote while many of our colleagues were still in their respective caucuses trying to hash out an agreement on an issue. And Bill, being a big fan of Broadway's, was reflecting on how this moment felt like a particular song from the musical Oklahoma. And there on the floor of the Wisconsin State Assembly, while in recess in the wee hours, on a bipartisan basis, we broke out in song singing, the farmer and the cowman can be friends. Now, because this is a speech about Bill Murat, this won't be the last time that I mention show tunes. After I was elected to the House of Representatives, Bill came to work with me, first as my district director, and then starting in 2001 as chief of staff. Bill's steady hand of leadership has helped me weather the storms that Washington brings and stay focused on what matters most, the people we serve in Wisconsin. I remember the days after September 11, 2001. It was chaotic, weighty, and frankly a scary time in Washington and across our nation. I had to get back to Wisconsin, but the planes were still grounded. So Bill walked into my office and simply said, need a ride? And so together we made that 14-hour trip home from Washington, D.C. to Madison, Wisconsin, noting the American flags that were hung from nearly every highway bridge we passed under and considering the gravity of the new world we were seeing emerge. 
Bill has been by my side for the highs and the lows of my time in Congress. I'm so proud of what we've done together, working to do right by the people of Wisconsin and to pass on to the next generation a country that is more equal, not less. His generosity of spirit extends to every constituent in Wisconsin, every colleague in Congress, and every staffer who has worked for him. His door is always open, and he has been a mentor to so many people who have worked in the Baldwin offices over the years. In fact, I know there are several former staff members of mine who have Bill to thank for their love of Broadway. Since he used to host Better Living through show tunes, uh, uh, as evening staff events. And to be honest, I am still jealous that these show tune nights always happened after Wheels Up and I was headed home to Wisconsin. But on a more serious note, Bill is a fierce advocate and ardent supporter of our Team Tammy family. And he is led by example, encouraging young people to pursue their passions doling out career advice to those who need it, and listening to the concerns of others, whether they are a Senate employee or a Wisconsinite looking for some assistance. Bill, who have spent over three decades working on behalf of the great state of Wisconsin, you and, have, you and I have accomplished much together. I would not be here today without you, and I am grateful for your friendship. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for the years of service, and I wish you the most fabulous retirement. Thank you, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Wyoming. I rise to raise a point of order on the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020 which provides funding for eight appropriation subcommittees and includes numerous tax and health care provisions and other new legislation called authorizations. That's code for bills that haven't been debated on the Senate floor. Um, Christmas presents for everyone, all put on the federal credit card, which is overspent already. This legislation was unveiled Monday afternoon, totals more than 1,800 pages, and here we are on Thursday with just hours to go before a government shutdown, being asked to vote on a bill which has not been subject to amendment or debate and which the Congressional Budget Office tells us will increase deficits by more than $400 billion over the next 10 years. Actually, by the time you add in interest costs to this debt, it's half a trillion in 10 years and two and one tenths trillion dollars on 20 years. That's uh, according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, who added in that interest, added it up. Uh, so that'll be half a trillion dollars of new overspending in one vote. And what makes it so expensive is that we're trying to do something here to buy everybody's vote. Uh, this bill was completely bypassed regular order and violates nearly all the Senate's self-imposed budget rules with its billions of dollars in giveaways and tax policy changes. We are legislating on funding bills. Legislation is supposed to be scrutinized differently, especially if they pay out real money. I'll remind my colleagues that our national debt stands at just over 23 trillion, hard to say, 23 trillion dollars. And the Congressional Budget Office tells us that the federal deficits are already on track to exceed a trillion dollars this year and every year thereafter. That's besides this two and one tenth trillion dollar add on. We should be talking about how to address the budgetary mess we're in, not pressing the gas on unsustainable fiscal trajectory which is exactly what this bill does. We're making promises that can't be fulfilled. Now, some people will mention the tax cuts and jobs bill, but uh, I need to emphasize and remind you that that boosted the economy. It created jobs and it increased wages and is bringing in more revenue than ever before, ever before. But we're spending it faster than it's coming in. 
So it's not a revenue problem, it's a spending problem. Now, rather than an aberration, budget busting has become commonplace. This is the second time this week that I've come to the floor to raise a point of order against legislation that violates the budget. But to be fair, from a budget perspective, this bill is exponentially worse than the defense authorization bill that we considered earlier this year. It's at least 50 times worse. I oppose this legislation. I oppose adding to the already massive debt burden being placed on future generations. Madam President, the pending measure, the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1865, the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act 2020, would cause a deficit increase of more than $5 billion in each of four consecutive 10-year periods beginning in fiscal year 2030. This increase violates Section 3101 of the 2016 Budget Resolution. Therefore, I raise a point of order under Section 3101B of SCON Res 11, the concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2016. I've been here long enough to know that you will now hear a list of wonderful things that are on this bill. You won't hear how to pay for all these Christmas presents. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Alabama. Madam President, pursuant to Section 904 of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 and the waiver provisions of applicable budget resolutions, I move to waive all applicable sections of that act and applicable budget resolutions for the purposes of consideration of the message to accompany H.R. 1865. And I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? Yeah. There appears to be. The clerk will. The yeas and nays are ordered. Under the previous order, the motion to concur with the amendment is withdrawn. The question is on the motion to waive. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. 
Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Markley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Perdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young.
Senators voting in the affirmative. Brown, Cantwell, Collins, Kramer, Durbin, Hyde-Smith, Jones, King, Leahy, Manchin, Markey, McConnell, Moran, Murray, Portman, Shelby, Thune, and Tillis. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Braun, Cotton, Enzi, Ernst, Gillibrand, Inhofe, Lee, Risch, Romney, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, and Tester. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, aye. Ms. Hassan, Ms. Hassan, aye. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, no. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, no. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, aye. Mr. Perdue, Mr. Perdue, no. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, no. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, aye. Mrs. Blackburn, Mrs. Blackburn, no. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, no. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Graham, Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, Aye, Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye.
Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, aye. Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, no. Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mrs. Capito, Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenthal, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, no. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, aye. Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, aye. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, no. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Ms. Rosen, Ms. Rosen, aye. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, aye.
Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, I. <laughs> Ms. Cinema, Ms. Cinema, I. Ms. Cortez Masto, Ms. Cortez Masto, I. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. <laughs> Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, no. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Ms. Duckworth, Ms. Duckworth, I. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, I.
Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, no, Mr. Deans, Mr. Deans, no, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, I, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, I. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, no. And then this. Yes. Are there any senators in the cha chamber wishing to vote or wishing to change their vote? Seeing none, on this vote, the yeas are 64, the nays are 30. Three fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn, having voted in the affirmative, the motion is agreed to. The question is on the motion to concur. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Changes his note to no. He's very confused. He's really about the minors. Mr. Booker. I didn't know, yeah. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. Ms. Cant Mr. Carden.
Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. You're in. Thank you. I didn't hear. I didn't hear. Her. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth. I didn't see you. I was, yeah, thank you. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Inzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Gardner. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Ms. Harris. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Inhoff. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King. Thank you. Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester.
Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Bennett, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Brown, Burr, Cantwell, Capito, Cardin, Collins, Coons, Cortez Masto, Kramer, Crapo, Duckworth, Durbin, Ernst, Feinstein, Fisher, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Hoven, Heidsmith, Jones, Kane, King, Leahy, Manchin, McConnell, McSally, Menendez, Merkley, Moran, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Reed, Rosen, Rounds, Shelby, Cinema, Stabenow, Thune, Tillis, Van Hollen, Wicker, and Wyden. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Blackburn, Braun, Cassidy, Cotton, Danes, Enzi, Hawley, Johnson, Kennedy, Lankford, Paul, Risch, Sass, Scott of Florida, and Toomey. Mr. Cornyn, no. Do you have the uh, Enzi amendments? Mr. Tester, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Udall, aye. Mr. Young, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye.
Mr. Markey, aye. Ms. Smith, aye. Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Schatz, aye. Mr. Inhofe. No. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. No. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Gardner, aye. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Cruz, no.
Mr. Roberts. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, no.
Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the yeas are 71, the nays are 23. The motion to concur is agreed to. Mr. President. The Senator for Pennsylvania. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that notwithstanding Rule 22, the Senate proceed to executive session and resume consideration of the single nomination. Further, that at 1.45 p.m., the Senate proceed to vote on the confirmations of the nominations under the previous order. Is there objection? Without objection. So ordered. The clerk will report. Nomination, the judiciary, Anurag Singhal of Florida to be United States District Judge for the Southern District of Florida. Mr. President. The Senator for Hawaii. Thank you, Mr. President. As if in legislative session, I ask unanimous consent the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs be discharged from further consideration of S. 3104, the Federal Employees Parental Leave Technical Correction Act, and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. I further ask that the bill be considered read a third time and passed, and that motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Uh, Mr. President. Senator for Pennsylvania. Uh, reserving the right to, uh, to object, uh, let me explain what's going on here. Uh, my colleague from Hawaii has an amendment that he'd like to make to the NDAA legislation that we passed recently. Uh, it's been described from our Democratic colleagues as a technical correction. Well, I've got a technical correction I'd like to have considered as well. And so I think we've got a good solution here where we can both get the technical corrections that we would like. Mine, we've been waiting on for two years. But the good news is we've got broad bipartisan support for mine. Every Republican senator supports it. Thirteen Democrats are co-sponsors of my legislation to make this technical correction. If my math is right, that means 66 senators support doing this. There's huge bipartisan support in the House. So I'd say let's fix both problems. What I'm referring to, the fix that I have in mind, is to fix a drafting error from our tax reform bill from two years ago. And specifically, it would be to restore the ability of people who make leasehold improvements to fully expense that at the time it occurs. That was always the intent. Nobody disputes that that was the intent. But because of a drafting error, when someone makes a leasehold improvement, not only are they unable to expense it in the year in which it occurs, but they have to depreciate it over 39 years, the exact opposite of our intention. This is a huge problem for restaurants and retailers generally. And every one of our states has how many retailers, how many restaurants that are adversely affected today by this technical error. And it's having an economic impact. This category of business investment is the only category that's declined over the last year. It was down almost 4% in the third quarter. And that's because of the adverse tax treatment. So that's not good for any of us. It's not good for the United States. It's not good for our states. Um, in the Omni uh, bill that we just passed, we had all kinds of tax provisions, $427 billion, actually, worth of tax provisions, announced at 2 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, by the way. It has things including a resurrection of special tax rules that were supposed to die in 2017. So we're going to send checks to people for what they did in 2018, which will have no impact whatsoever, obviously, on changing incentives since it's the past. We did that. We reversed a deal that was struck in 2015 to phase out expensive renewable energy credits. We made two changes to the tax reform of 2017, but we weren't able to include the technical fix that 66 senators want that would cost zero. Uh, what we were told by our Democratic colleagues is if you want to do that, there's a price you have to pay, and the price would be tens of billions of dollars of increases in refundable tax credits. That's checks being sent to people who don't pay taxes. And the ranking member of the Finance Committee, Senator Wyden, said just this week, and I quote, Democrats have long said that Republicans need to negotiate on broader issues if they want to fix all the mistakes in their tax giveaway. 
So in other words, there has to be a price. Well, if I were adopting the approach of my Democratic colleagues, then when my colleague from Hawaii comes down and makes this request, I could say, well, you need to come up with $50 billion worth of Republican priorities, maybe $50 billion worth of capital gains tax cuts, or $50 billion in reduction in some kind of mandatory spending or something. That's what I would do if I were taking the exact same approach that our Democratic colleagues took. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to suggest that we both get what we're after here and the American people get the benefit. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to modify the unanimous consent request. And the way I'm going to do that is to take the bill advocated by the senator from Hawaii, drop it into a legislative vehicle, add the technical fix that I and 66 senators support. And by the way, 297 House members have co-sponsored the companion legislation, including 145 Democrat House members. I'm going to put them together in an otherwise empty legislative vehicle so that we can do both. And when we pass it here in the Senate by unanimous consent in just a moment, if we do, then the House would virtually be assured of passage since 297 House members have co-sponsored this legislation. So, Mr. President, my suggestion is we modify this unanimous consent request so that the senator from Hawaii gets the provision that he wants and I get the provision that 66 senators want. So I ask that the senator modify his request so that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 157, H.R. 748. I further ask that the Toomey Amendment at the desk be considered and agreed to, the bill as amended be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Does the senator so modify his request? Reserving the right to object. And let's just get clear about what's happening here. Uh, the first thing is we did something momentous as a Congress. Uh, we, on a bipartisan basis, decided to provide paid parental leave of 12 weeks uh, for the federal workforce, 2.1 million federal workforce, so that individuals who are parents, new parents, don't have to make that impossible choice between receiving a paycheck and being a new dad or a new mom. Now, this is catching us up with the rest of the world. The rest of the industrialized world understands that this isn't just a humane thing to do for families. This is the right way to manage a workforce because you get higher productivity, you get better morale, and you get lower turnover. So this is the smart thing to do. So there were 2.1 million people covered by this momentous change in federal policy agreed upon uh, over the last 48 hours on a bipartisan basis. But there was a technical problem, and so the following federal employees are not going to be covered unless we make this technical fix. Employees of the D.C. courts, public defenders, presidential appointees, FAA and TSA employees, and Article I judges. Everybody else is going to get 12 weeks of paid parental leave except for these people. And we could solve that today, and that's what my unanimous consent request is all about. And what the senator from Pennsylvania has decided to do is take a hostage and say, these are the only federal employees who are not going to get this benefit because of a technical and drafting error, because I didn't get something totally unrelated that has to do with a tax bill that was passed on purely partisan lines in a hurry, written primarily by lobbyists in the middle of the night. Now, I don't mind entertaining a change to the tax code to deal with this question of how you expense the renovation of restaurants and retail operations. But I think Senator Wyden is exactly right, and I guess uh, Senator from Pennsylvania thought that this was a talking point on the Republican side to say, I can't imagine, heaven forfend, there should be a negotiation. Heaven forfend that something that is important to the Republicans that is as a result of their screw up and would cost tens of billions of dollars would not be given away for free. Now the argument being made is, hey, technical for technical. This is an actual technical fix. This is a bill we just enacted in the last 48 hours. I'm not even sure if the president has signed it yet, but it's about to be enacted into law, and nobody is arguing that we should not cover some small portion of the federal workforce. Nobody's arguing that that was the legislative intent. Nobody's arguing that that's public policy. What the senator from Pennsylvania is saying is, if I don't get my thing, then these people don't 
get the help that they deserve. These people, by happenstance of a drafting error, don't get paid parental leave. Now, this has human consequences. And so I object to the senator's modification of my unanimous consent request, and I am deeply disappointed that we can't fix this simple thing. I'm happy to work with the senator from Pennsylvania on a quip fix. I think we will get there at some point next year, but this has to be part of a broader bipartisan deal, and he knows that. This is going to cost tens of billions of dollars, and nobody gives away tens of billions of dollars for nothing. Everything of that magnitude has to be negotiated on a bipartisan, bicameral uh, basis. And that's not what he's trying to do. He's trying to say, because we made a technical error that is monumentally wrong, and as a result of a flawed process, then why don't we trade technical fixes? This is a relatively small technical fix, and he wants to trade it for a massive technical fix that is now two years old. The other thing I would say is this may be small in the context of how we operate in the United States Senate. It's not small if you work for the FAA and you're a new dad. It's not small if you're an Article I judge and you're a new mom. It's not small for these people who deserve paid parental leave like every other federal employee uh, will get soon. The objection is heard to the modification. Is there objection to the original request? Mr. President. The Senator for Pennsylvania. I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked by what I just heard, um, uh, that, that I'm char characterized as taking a hostage. Let's just be very clear. I am the senator on the floor who is proposing that both senators get their way, that the outcome works for both sides. This is a Democratic priority. Some Republicans support it, some don't. It's a Democratic priority and a mistake that was made. And I'm suggesting let's fix it. And let's take the opportunity to also fix something that 66 senators have supported. They've co-sponsored it. There's even broader support, much broader, in the House, where it's, like, massive. I don't know what's more reasonable than a very broadly bipartisan technical fix that scores at zero and helps every single community in America, and tying that with, a, with an opportunity to do something that's a very high priority for my colleague from Hawaii. So since we, uh, my colleague from Hawaii refuses to, uh, to allow us both to be able to uh, accomplish this, I'm going to have to hope that we can do it another time, and I will object to his request. Objection is heard. Mr. President. Senator for Oklahoma. President, as a, uh, on another subject, even though I'm very close to this subject in that I uh, chair the Armed Services Committee and that's where all this uh, really began, I, I do want to mention one thing about what happened this morning. Uh, I think our leader over here, Mitch McConnell, did a superb job. He made it very clear on the impeachment that took place Last night, it's something that happened. It's, un, it's, it's not happened before. Uh, it's the first time it's happened, and there's no impeachable offense. And it's uh, nonetheless, I think it was all driven by hatred. And when you stop and think, here it is, right before Christmas, and the hatred is driven that it's, it is wrong. But you know, I want to mention something significant that you haven't thought of. I say to the the, the president. And that is this 53rd day of the year is very significant. That's December 19th. And people have not stopped to realize the significant things that have happened on December 19th throughout our history and the history of the world. Going all the way back on December the 19th, in 1154, Henry II became king of England. Well, we haven't really thought about the fact that what does that mean to us today? But we will uh, before long. And in 1843, December 19th, again, Charles Dickens he wrote what was it? The Christmas Carol, right? And that is the most watched, listened to, and sung uh, event every, every, every Christmas. And in 1932, the, uh, December 19th, the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, began transmitting overseas. That was the beginning of a whole new world of knowledge and understanding. In uh, 1950, December the 19th, NATO named 
General Dwight D. Eisenhower as Supreme Commander of the Western European Defense Forces. Then in 1972, uh, December 19th, Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo moon landings, returned to Earth. And then December 19th of 1984, and I remember this well because I was in Hong Kong when this happened. That was when China signed an accord returning Hong Kong to the Chinese sovereignty, something that a lot of people thought was good at the time, except the people from Hong Kong. And I was there, and look what's happened now after all these years. So anyway, I, I would have to say that that hysteria has continued to this day. Then in 1998, December 19th, United States President Bill Clinton was impeached. And I was there at that one, too, and uh, we have something to compare it with now. But that was December the 19th, 1998. But the event that is more significant by a landslide is nothing, nothing uh, is what happened on December the 19th, 1959. On December the 19th, 1959, my wife Kay and I got married. And so that makes this the 60th anniversary of our wedding. And uh, just look at the, all the beauty that has followed us, 20 kids and grandkids, all of that in that 60-year period of time. So what I want to say is the beautiful life that we're still having together. And, uh, and I would like to say at this point that, Kay, after 60 years, I still love you, and I wish you a happy anniversary. And to everyone else, out there as you celebrate the birth of Jesus. Merry Christmas and God bless you. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator for Michigan. Mr. President, uh, I rise today in support of Judge Stephanie Dawkins Davis for the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. I had the honor of introducing Judge Dawkins Davis at the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing more than six months ago. As I told the members of the committee, Judge Dawkins Davis is a highly respected member of the Michigan legal community, and she will serve our state well as a district court judge. Judge Dawkins Davis has been an exemplary public servant who has worked hard and honorably to serve the people of the state of Michigan. She has earned the respect of colleagues across the state and garnered numerous awards uh, throughout her career. She began her career as a civil defense attorney at Dickinson Wright and later joined the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan office, prosecuting cases at both the trial and appellate levels. She also spent time as a deputy unit chief of the Controlled Substances Unit and as a high-intensity drug trafficking area liaison. Her successful work led her to her appointment as Executive Assistant U.S. Attorney, and after that she became a Magistrate Judge for the Eastern District and was selected to serve at the Flint Federal Courthouse. Judge Dawkins Davis uh, is a qualified jurist. The American Bar Association unanimously rated her as well qualified. She was, all, she was also the first African-American woman nominated by President Trump for a federal judgeship. I am proud to recognize Judge Dawkins Davis for her many accomplishments and for the diverse voice and perspective that she will bring to the bench. This seat has been vacant since October 26, 2016. That's more than three years. It's past time the Senate consider Judge Dawkins Davis' nomination, and I'm glad that that is finally happening, happening today. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President, I suggest the uh, absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Senator for Kansas. I ask uh, unanimous consent to vitiate the quorum call. Without objection. The question occurs on the Singh Paul nomination. Is and nays are requested. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Brasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Langford. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Perdue. Mr. Peters. Mr. Portman. Mr. Reed. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, 
Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sass. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Blumenthal, Brown, Cardin, Carper, Cassidy, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Feinstein, Hassan, Jones, Kane, King, Manchin, Moran, Murphy, Peters, Reed, Rosen, Scott of Florida, Cinema, Tester, and Young. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Bennett, Gillibrand, Heinrich, Markey, Murray, Schott, Smith, Udall, and Whitehouse. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Brasso, Mr. Brasso, aye. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tillis, aye. Mrs. Blackburn, Mrs. Blackburn, 
Aye. Mrs. Capito, Mrs. Capito. Aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley. Aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mr. Purdue, Mr. Purdue. Aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo. Aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley. Aye. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton. Aye. Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst. Aye. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski. Aye. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rounds. Aye. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, aye. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, aye. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, aye. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Rish, Mr. Rish, aye. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, aye. Mr. Alexander, Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Leahy, Mr. Leahy, ah. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, ah. Mr. Danes, Mr. Danes, ah. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, ah. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, ah. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, ah. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, ah. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, ah. Mr. Braun, Mr. Braun, ah. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, ah. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, no. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, ah. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Kramer, ah.
Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, ah. Okay. It's the understanding of the chair this is a 10-minute vote, and it will be enforced. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, ah. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, no. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, ah. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, ah. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, ah.
members in the chamber wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the yeas are 76, the nays are 17. The nominations confirmed. Mr. President. The majority leader. I just cut off a member of our own side because they didn't get here in time. That's an underscore that by popular demand, everybody wants this, these times to be kept, and that's what we intend to do. I ask unanimous consent that the votes in this series be 10 minutes in length. Without objection. The clerk will report the Marston nomination. The question the judiciary, occurs. Judiciary, Karen Spencer Marston of Pennsylvania to be United States District Judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. The question occurs on the nomination. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Aye. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn, Aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Wicker. Sorry, thank you. Gaines and then Cruz, Collins. Young Eye. Cinema, Duckworth. Well and Murray. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Shots. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Carpen. Roberts. Thank you. Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito. Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper. I did get you, thank you. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, 
Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, minutes. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley. Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida. Thank you. I do. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby. I did, thank you. Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Barrasso, Bennett, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Braun, Cantwell, Capito, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Collins, Coons, Cortez Masto, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Durbin, Inzi, Ernst, Feinstein, Fisher, Gardner, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Hirono, Hydesmith, Inhofe, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Lankford, Leahy, Manchin, McConnell, McSally, Menendez, Moran, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Paul, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Reed, Risch, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Schatz, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Cinema, Stabenow, Sullivan, Tester, Thune, Tillis, Warner, Whitehouse, Wicker, and Young. Mr. Van Hollen, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Cotton, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Gillibrand, Markey, Merkley, Smith, and Wyden. In Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Johnson, aye. 
Yes. Yeah. Mr. Brown, aye. Adrian. Shelby is an aye. Mr. Shelby, aye. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Udall, aye. Thank you. Mr. Heinrich, yes. aye. Mr. Cassidy, aye. Mr. Lee, aye. I'm missing one person. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the yeas are 87, the nays are 6, the nominations confirmed. The clerk will report the trainer nomination. Nomination, the judiciary, Daniel Mack Trainer of North Dakota to be United States District Judge for the District of North Dakota. Question occurs on the motion. Question occurs on the nomination. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz.
Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi. Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran. Ms. Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray. Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue. Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Blackburn, Blunt, Braun, Capito, Cassidy, Collins, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Enzi, Ernst, Fisher, Hawley, Hoven, Hyde Smith, Inhofe, Johnson, Kennedy, Langford, McSally, Moran, Murkowski, Paul, Purdue, Portman, Risch, Romney, Rounds, Scott of Florida, Sullivan, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, and Young. Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Baldwin, Blumenthal, Brown, Cantwell, Cardin, Casey, Coons, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Gillibrand, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Jones, Kane, King, Leahy, Manchin, Markey, Menendez, Merkley, Murray, Peters, Reed, Rosen, Shaheen, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Udall, and Wyden. Welcome. 
Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, no. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, ah. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, ah. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, ah. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, ah. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, ah. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Brasso, Mr. Brasso, ah. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, ah. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, ah. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, ah. Uh. Mr. 
Murphy. Mr. Murphy. No. Is there any senator wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the yeas are 51, the nays are 41. The nominations confirm. The clerk will report the Dishman nomination. The Judiciary, Jody W. Dishman of Oklahoma to be United States District Judge for the Western District of Oklahoma. Question occurs on the nomination. Yeas and nays. Is sufficient second? There appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Jones, where's the leader? Yes, I do. Thank you. Feinstein, cinema. Mendez? No. Blumenthal? Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt. Yes, I do. Thank you. No. Thank you. Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy. Did he say I? I got you as an I. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons, 
Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Thank you. Ms. McSally, Thank you. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul. Mr. Perdue. Mr. Peters. Mr. Portman. Mr. Reed. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. I did get you. Thank you. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young,
Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Barrasso, Bennett, Blackburn, Bozeman, Braun, Brown, Capito, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Cassidy, Collins, Coons, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Durbin, Enzi, Ernst, Feinstein, Fisher, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Hawley, Hoven, Heidsmith, Inhoff, Johnson, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Lankford, Leahy, Lee, Manchin, McSally, Moran, Murkowski, Murphy, Paul, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Risch, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shaheen, Shelby, Cinema, Sullivan, Tester, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, White House, Wicker, and Young. Mr. Blunt? Aye. Senators voting in the negative. Baldwin, Blumenthal, Cantwell, Gillibrand, Heinrich, Hirono, Markey, Menendez, Merkley, Murray, Schatz, Schumer, Smith, Stabenow, Udall, Van Hollen, and Wyden. Mr. Gardner, aye. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Reed, aye. I thought.
Any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the yeas are 75, the nays are 17, the nominations confirm. The clerk will report the Gallagher nomination. The Judiciary, John M. Gallagher of Pennsylvania to be United States District Judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Qu questions on the nomination? Yeas and nays. Sufficient second. Appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Ms. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun. Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Deans, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono. Thank you. Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, thank you. Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSa Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, 
Mr. Paul, Mr. Perdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative, Baldwin, Barrasso, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Braun, Brown, Capito, Cardin, Casey, Cassidy, Collins, Cornyn, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Durbin, Enzi, Ernst, Gardner, Graham, Hassan, Hawley, Heinrich, Hyde-Smith, Inhofe, Johnson, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Lankford, Leahy, Lee, Manchin, McSally, Menendez, Murphy, Paul, Purdue, Peters, Reed, Risch, Roberts, Rosen, Rounds, Sass, Schatz, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Sullivan, Tester, Tillis, Udall, Van Hollen, Whitehouse, Wicker, and Young. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, Ms. Cortez Masto, aye. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the negative. Bennett, Cantwell, Gillibrand, Markey, Murray, Schumer, Stabenow, and Wyden. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye.
is a 10-minute vote, and it will be enforced. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, aye. Is this a previous vote? Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or change their vote? It's all right. It's okay to have a... Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, aye. If not, the yeas are 83, the nays are 9. Nominations confirmed. The clerk will report the Jones nomination. Nomination. The Judiciary. Bernard Maurice Jones II of Oklahoma to be United sense. States District Judge for the Western District of Oklahoma. Questions on the nomination? Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Barrasso, Bennett, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Braun, Brown, Cantwell, Capito, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Cassidy, Collins, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Cotton, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Enzi, Ernst, Feinstein, Fisher, Gardner, Graham, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Hoven, Hydesmith, Inhoff, Johnson, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, 
King, Langford, Leahy, Lee, Manchin, McConnell, McSally, Menendez, Merkley, Moran, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Hall, Purdue, Peters, Reed, Risch, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shaheen, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Sullivan, Tester, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, Wyden, Young. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Kramer, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Markey Schumer. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, aye. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Any senators wishing to vote or change your vote? If not, the ayes are 91, the nays are 3, the nomination is confirmed. The clerk will report the next nomination. The Judiciary, Mary Kay Viscasil of New York to be United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. Questions on the nomination? Is there a sufficient second? Appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin. Mr.
Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan. Sorry. Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Barrasso, Bennett, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Braun, Brown, Burr, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Cassidy, Collins, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Enzi, Ernst, Fisher, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Hawley, Hyde Smith, Inhofe, Johnson, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Langford, Leahy, McSally, Menendez, Murphy, Murray, Paul, Purdue, Peters, Reed, Risch, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Sass, Schatz, Scott of Florida, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Sullivan, Tester, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, Udall, Van Hollen, Warner, Whitehouse, Wicker, and Young. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell. I, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, I, Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, I. Senators voting in the negative, Gillibrand, Heinrich, Markey. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, I, Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, I, Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, 
Aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Risch, Mr. Risch, aye. Mrs. Capito, Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Kramer. Aye, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin. Aye, Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley. Aye, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer. Aye, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, aye. Any senators wishing to vote or change your vote? If not, the ayes are 91, the nays are 3, the nomination is confirmed. <laughs> Clerk will report the next nomination. The Judiciary, Kia Wetzel Riggs of New Mexico to be United States District Judge for the District of New Mexico. Questions on the nomination? Is there a sufficient second? Appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey. <coughs> Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, 
Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Barrasso, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Bozeman, Braun, Brown, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Cassidy, Collins, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Durbin, Enzi, Feinstein, Fisher, Gardner, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Hoven, Hyde Smith, Inhofe, Johnson, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Leahy, Lee, Manchin, Markey, McSally, Menendez, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Paul, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Reed, Risch, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Schatz, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shaheen, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Sullivan, Tester, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, Udall, Van Hollen, Wicker, Wyden, Young. Mr. Schumer voted in the negative. Mrs. Capucho, Mrs. Capucho, aye. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lankford, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, aye.
Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst, aye. Are wishing to vote or change a vote? If not, the ayes are 94, the nays are zero. The nomination is confirmed. The majority leader. <clears throat> would, I order, would I have order in the Senate? I ask unanimous consent. I ask unanimous consent that the cloture motion with respect to executive calendar number 550 be withdrawn. Is there objection? Without objection. I further ask that following disposition of the Davis nomination, the Senate resume consideration of the Begin nomination and vote on the nomination on confirmation of the nomination. Finally, if confirmed, the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table, and the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action. Is there objection? Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that following the disposition of the Begin nomination, the Senate proceed to legislative session and resume consideration of the House message to accompany H.R. 1158. If cloture is invoked on the motion to concur in the House amendment to the Senate amendment to H.R. 1158, the post cloture time be expired, the other pending motions and amendments be withdrawn, and the Senate vote on adoption of the motion to concur in the House amendment to the Senate amendment to H.R. 1158 with no intervening action or debate. Is our objection? May we add the Senate's congrats. Without objection. The clerk will report the next nomination. The Judiciary, Robert J. Colville of Pennsylvania to be United States District Judge for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Is there a sufficient second? There is. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Brasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell.
Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman. Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young, Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Bennett, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Brown, Burr, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Cassidy, Coons, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Gillibrand, Graham, Hassan, Heinrich, Hyde Smith, Johnson, Jones, 
Kane, King, Leahy, McConnell, McSally, Menendez, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Purdue, Peters, Roberts, Rosen, Rounds, Schatz, Schumer, Scott of Florida, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Toomey, Van Hollen, Warner, White House, Wicker, Wyden, and Young. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Udall. Mr. Udall, aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed, aye. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, yes, sir. Mrs. Blackburn, Mrs. Oh. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Blackburn, Braun, Capito, Cotton, Kramer, Cruz, Danes, Enzi, Ernst, Fisher, Gardner, Hawley, Hoven, Inhofe, Langford, Lee, Risch, Rubio, Sass, Scott of South Carolina, Sullivan, and Tillis. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, no. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, no. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, no.
Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rounds, no. Any senators wishing to vote or change your vote? If not, the ayes are 66, the nays are 27. The nomination is confirmed. The clerk will report the next nomination. The Judiciary, Louis J. Lyman of New York to be United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. Questions on the nomination? Yeas and nays? Su sufficient second? Uh, appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Aye. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Shelby, Roberts, Murkowski. Okay, wait. Wait just a moment, just a moment. Hirano, can't rush me. Melendez, Merkley, Rubio. Ernst. Thank you. I got Merkley, Leahy, Blumenthal, Murray. Pardon? Reed. Got you. Pardon? Wicker. Rosen. Smith. Durbin. Hold on a second. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito. Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, of course. It's quite right. Ms. Collins. Thank you. Mr. Coons. Thanks. How are we doing? Cinema. Cinema. Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton. Pretty good. Do you, you want to vote aye? I found out about the five minute buffer. 
Yeah. You gotta, you gotta squeeze that. Someone I know first is Yes. The, uh, yes. Okay. Peters. All right. All right. Good. Hey, he's bringing intensity. They grow them strong in southern Indiana. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth. I will. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Inzi. Ms. Ernst. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley. Ms. Harris. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hirono. I got you, Ms. I did. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Cassidy, I got you. Thank you. Mr. Cass <laughs> Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sass. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young, Mr. 
Senators voting in the affirmative, Alexander, Baldwin, Bennett, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Brown, Burr, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Collins, Coons, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Enzi, Feinstein, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Hydesmith, Jones, Kane, King, Leahy, Manchin, Markey, McSally, Menendez, Merkley, Moran, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Reed, Roberts, Rosen, Schumer, Scott of Florida, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Tillis, Toomey, Udall, Van Hollen, Warner, Wicker, Wyden, and Young. Mr. Schatz, aye. No. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Bozeman, Braun, Capito, Cassidy, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Ernst, Fisher, Gardner, Hawley, Inhofe, Johnson, Kennedy, Lankford, Lee, Risch, Romney, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Scott of South Carolina, and Sullivan. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mrs. Blackburn, no. Just Isaacson for you? Isaacson and Paul. Paul. Is Paul missing the rest of the Mr. Thune, no. Mr. Hoven, no. Any senators wishing to vote or change your vote? If not, the ayes are 64, the nays are 29, the nomination is confirmed. The clerk will report the next nomination. Nomination, the judiciary, Gary Richard Brown of New York to be United States District Judge for the Eastern District of New York. <clears throat> Questions on the nomination? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The eyes appear to have it. The eyes do have it. Nomination is confirmed. Clerk will report the next nomination. Nomination, the judiciary. Stephanie Dawkins Davis of Michigan to be United States District Judge for the Eastern District of Michigan. Questions on the nomination? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The eyes appear to have it. The eyes do have it. Nomination is confirmed. Clerk will report the next nomination. Nomination, Department of State, Stephen E. Beacon of Michigan to be Deputy Secretary. Questions on the nomination? Is there a sufficient second? 
Second. Appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin. Okay, Mr. Cool. Brasso. Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Brown. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, 
Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Baldwin, Barrasso, Bennett, Blackburn, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Braun, Brown, Burr, Cantwell, Capito, Cardin, Cassidy, Collins, Coons, Cortez Masto, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Duckworth, Enzi, Ernst, Fisher, Gardner, Graham, Grassley, Hassan, Hawley, Heinrich, Hyde Smith, Inhoff, Johnson, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Langford, Leahy, McConnell, Menendez, Moran, Murkowski, Murray, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Reed, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Schatz, Schumer, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shaheen, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Thume, Tillis, Warner, Wyden, and Young. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand voted in the negative. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Risch, Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, aye. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, aye.
Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, no. Any senator wishing to vote or change a vote? If not, the ayes are 90, the nays are 3, the nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motions to reconsider are considered, made and laid on the uh, table, and the president shall so be immediately notified of the Senate's action. The Senate will resume legislative session. The Senate will resume legislative session. The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion, we the undersigned senators in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate do hereby move to bring to a closed debate on the motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1158, an act to authorize the cyber incident response teams at the Department of Homeland Security and for other purposes signed by 17 senators. Order, please. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1158, an act to authorize cyber incident response teams at the Department of Homeland Security and for other purposes shall be brought to a close? The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso. Sorry, sir. Hey, Grassley. They got Grassley. Cornyn. Shelby. Roberts, Murkowski, Thin. Thin. Murkowski. You. You're right there, Casey. Murray. Rounds. And then in Inhofe. Cotton. Moran. Young. Kills. Horano. Markley. Rosen. Reed. <laughs> gotcha. Kane, Brown, Durbin. Kane, Durbin, Smith. Thank you, Kennedy.
Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Thank you. I have you. yeah, I have you. Hey, do you have the uh, phone number? Can I give you that? Yeah, he was right. Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo. I did. No, no. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Durbin. I did. Thank you. Mr. Inzi. Ms. Ernst. Mrs. Feinstein. You wait. Thank you. Did you want to vote? Aye. Mrs. Fisher. No, not yet. Mr. Gardner. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King. Did you? Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford. Mr. Leahy. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Yes. Mr. McConnell. Ms. McSally. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Moran, 
Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young, Senators voting in the affirmative Alexander, Baldwin, Barrasso, Bennett, Blumenthal, Blunt. Bozeman, Brown, Burr, Capito, Cardin, Casey, Collins, Coons, Cornyn, Cortez Masto, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Danes, Duckworth, Durbin, Enzi, Feinstein, Fisher, Gardner, Grassley, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Hoven, Hydesmith, Inhoff, Jones, Kane, Kennedy, King, Lankford, Leahy, Manchin, McConnell, McSally, Menendez, Moran, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Purdue, Peters, Portman, Reed, Risch, Roberts, Romney, Rosen, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Schatz, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shaheen, Shelby, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Thune, Tillis, Udall, Wicker, and Young. Mr. Warner, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Carper, Cassidy, Ernst, Hawley, Johnson, Lee, Merkley, and Toomey. Mr. Braun, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Wyden, no. Mrs. Blackburn, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Cruz, no. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Cat. Oh. Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. White House, aye. On this vote, the yeas are 77, the nays are 16. Three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn having voted in the affirmative. The motion is agreed to. Under the previous order, the cloture having been invoked on the motion to concur, the other pending motions are withdrawn. The question occurs on the motion to concur. Is there a sufficient second? Appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mm-hmm. 